All right, let's go ahead and get it started with this video from a Leighton, 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 I don't know how Leighton says his name, but Leighton is a content creator that I actually, we know each other enough. We've talked a few times in private or once in private or something, but like years ago, we came across each other's content and um, he's somebody that I always see in people's comments, which is pretty funny, but he is a great content creator and he doesn't post very often, but when he does, it's always a banger. So of course I'm already subscribed to his channel. This is called Deconstructing the Menosphere and Red Pill, which we love masochism here on this channel. So we're gonna watch another Red Pill video, bros. Let's go. And already it starts off with Sneeko and Fresh and Fit, which <laughs> you know how I feel about them. Um, so anyway, still rooting for Sneeko. I give him 10 years or nine years now, probably because it's been a bit already. He's got nine more years to get into shape, okay? By the time he's my age, he has to get it into shape. With that said, I have little to no faith for Fresh and Myron. I'm pretty sure that's that's just how it's gonna go for them. Walter, Walter and Myron, anyways, okay. With that said, I'm of course gonna link the video. Please go like it. Please go subscribe. The Red Pill community. The Red Pill. The Red Pill. The Red Pill. The Red Pill. The Red Pill is a mindset, worldview, ideology within the manosphere, which has been gaining. How is the audio? Leighton's soft, lovely, amazing voice is a little quiet for me. I just want to make sure you guys are hearing him. A lot of popularity as of late, and despite it ostensibly being about the pursuit of the capital T truth, for some reason it has a subset of men and even young boys beginning to sound like this. What did you say? F the woman, f the woman. What? We love women. We love women. We love women. What? Not, not love transgender. Yes, sir. We love everybody. I just, again, every time they show this clip, I just want to give everyone a reminder that the Menosphere, Red Pill, everything else did not encourage this kind of discussion. This is called being a conservative. I just want you to know that I was much, I was raised with this rhetoric my whole life in conservative bubbles because like even the whole like men versus women thing, like as if this is new. I just want to remind everybody that the Red Pill did not invent like men versus women. Like I just, okay. Oh, oh no, if you watch enough red pill content, you will conclude that there isn't a singular truth that they're coming to, rather they're seemingly supplying credibility toward two truths, which is to say the truth about society, which they refer to as the matrix, and then the other half of that, which is probably the thing you're both nervous and excited for me to talk about the truth about women what the red pill refers to as female nature which includes presuppositions like the idea that women live life on easy mode women have it on easy mode women live life on <laughs> okay first of all men are s men who think like this are so pathetic to be like women have it on easy mode i'm sorry if you want to be objectified and used for your body you can go appeal to men like literally these straight men could go do that, but they don't want to do it. And then they talk bad on women who do do it. But women are not living life on easy mode. If you think that is true, if you genuinely think that is true, like that is fine. That is your narrative. Just like women think like men live it on easy mode. We all think other people live it on easy mode when we're literally such victim like mentality people. Like what a victim mentality, right? When you uphold the victim mentality, which is fine. That's your prerogative. And sometimes you are an actual victim because like what is a system? But okay. Like, yes, you'll think other people have it easier than you, but the reality is like everybody has it easier than you and everyone has it worse. On a spectrum of 8 billion people, everybody has it worse and everybody has it better. But the idea that like men or women, like again, as a woman, we can't even walk outside at night without being terrified. And I know for a fact, a majority of men always go like, oh, I'm also afraid. Are you? Because you do it. You actually get to do it. You can't be that afraid. Because women, literally, we just don't do it in certain bubbles. In certain bubbles, we don't go outside past a certain time of night. And men, as far as I know, every man I know, still goes outside. So you can't be that afraid. Like, I am literally terrified of walking alone at nighttime past 5 p.m. Once the sun goes down, I am in paranoid mode every time I walk in my own neighborhood. So are you telling me men feel that way past 5 p.m.? They literally feel afraid to walk outside? And again, certain girls don't have that fear, but I certainly grew up with that anxiety. An easy mode. Women live life on easy mode in 2023. However, that their value peaks at the ripe old age of 23 years old. So in this video, I will be combining my academic background as well as my background of being terminally online to determine whether the red pill is merely telling boys, young men to self-improve or whether the red pill is actually a bastion of misogyny.
misogyny. Hello and welcome back to the Late Onicles channel. It is I, the Leighton in question, and today we will be investigating the Red Pill, a subsidiary ideology within the Manosphere. So, over the past few months, if not years, you have likely noticed an uptick in the discourse surrounding sex and dating dynamics, and this is probably primarily propagated by- Do men's careers get better as they age, or do they say about basic, you know what I mean? Brittany, what percentages are those men, do you think, either group? The men that, like, aren't afraid of going outside of the men who are? That's the thing. It's all bubble-based. So, like, for from my understanding of men who tell me about their lives, very anecdotal here, versus women who tell me about their lives, most of the men I know are perfectly – they're they're on edge, but they're also – they do it. Like, they're much more comfortable going outside than most of the women that I talk to. Most of the men that I talk to do not rush into their car, slam the door, and lock it, unlike the number of women I talk to. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but I don't know. Like, I watch videos – like, there's a reason why women talk about taking self-defense classes and men are just, like, I think supposed to be strong. I don't know. I don't know. In terms of careers, I don't know – what it will look like in 50 years because women are doing a little bit better but in education, but I'm not sure that that matters. I just don't know what the world will look like. But this is so bubble dependent, guys. Like ultimately, I don't even know what it means to be a man or a woman when it's so bubble dependent. And again, I think about it in terms of having a daughter and having a son, at least in the bubble that I grew up in, the expectations for men in terms of their vulnerabilities around other men are less concerning than women around a bunch of men. And like, again, I don't know what bubble protects men from being around other men over women. Most bubbles I have heard of are more afraid for females being around males than males being around females or males being around other males. So I don't know if you guys have or can name a country that their culture is just as afraid as, of men being around men as they are afraid of about women being around men. Like, what's that What's that typical, like, scenario we all give is, like, a one woman, a naked woman in a room full of 100 men is, like, frightening, but a naked man in a room full of women is typically, like, less frightening because the women are more likely to clothe him and be like, why are you naked? What are you doing? You know what I mean? Now, not that women can't be assaulters, not that women don't grope men, not that women aren't objectifying, not that women don't assault men. Like, I'm not saying that, but there is a stereotype. And we like stereotypes are kind of rooted in some sort of reflection of culture. So I'm just trying to figure out like what culture primarily is all about, like protecting boys around other men. Gang culture is a good example. That's a good one, Henry. That's a good example. I think that makes sense. So gang culture is a really good example of that particular bubble is you're most likely going to protect your boys from being around other groups of men. Um, but women too, right? Aren't women usually protected from gang culture? Like what's safer for what's safer a man in a gang or a woman in a gang? Like, what do you say for, aren't you safer as a man in a gang than a woman in a gang? Or no, do women get protected more in a gang because they're the women? Or do women get, like, what's the, what is it? You know? Vash says, I mean, from my logic, even if I was afraid, I know not to act afraid. Being outwardly afraid makes you a target. I've been in situations where I could have, it could have truly gone badly. Fair. Um... Oh, Henry says, I grew up around gang culture and men are dangerous. Men are definitely dangerous, for sure. You know? Women groping men was accepted while I was growing up, encouraged even. I think that's the irony, is like when I was growing up, it was also encouraged by the men to show like outwardly affection. And I stopped doing it once I got into SJW progressive circles because I decided that I wasn't going to like break men's consent, even if they were telling me to do it, because so many men were telling me like, do it. But then I started to feel really bad about it. And I was like, I don't want to flirt with you this way. Like, I don't want to touch you without your consent. But then some people were like, that's so gross. Just like touch me. What are you doing? And I was like, I just want to hang out with those people. Matt Reif is actually going viral right now, the comedian. And a big reason why he sort of made a Netflix special that was anti-women, other than the misogyny, was because he 
had really bad experiences with his female audience. Like women were coming to his shows because he got plastic surgery and he started working out. He looked hotter than his original aesthetic. And when he got hot, women started to watch him and objectify him. And then they would grope him and touch him at events. And so he got a really bad taste in his mouth for female audiences, which I absolutely straight women who aren't in progressive circles. And even those who are like, if they're not consent based, they're going to grope you like they're going to grope you. And queer people in general, I think, are more consent based, um, at least modern progressives are. So like, again, queer people can assault you, too. But I believe Matt Reif. I believe him that women were assaulting him at his events. I mean, even Shia LaBeouf had the same thing happen to him during one of his art installations, like where a woman groped him and like grinded up against him against his consent. So, again, I do believe men when they tell me these stories that women are groping them. And I also need women to understand that like the same men that are telling you to grope them aren't necessarily all the men in the world. So be very careful who you're interacting interacting with. Same with men. Men will think like hitting on women, following women, catcalling women is hot to women because some women will say they like it. But some women isn't all women. So I really need everyone to understand that when you're interacting with a person, you have to ask yourself, what bubble are they from? What's their cultural expectation? How should I treat them? What language means, like translates to them that they're safe? All of those things matter. And so again, when we're having these conversations, I just want people to really consider that not all men want your sexual aggressiveness. And then the ones who do, like, I guess you can ask them first. But like, I I understand Matt Reif's decision to like, reject the female audience but also like weird way to do it bro like your trauma is showing like it's very trauma based which is fine but like this is why trauma is bad because it makes you hate a whole group of people when it's not deserved by podcasts such as fresh and fit i've said on the podcast many times a woman's ejaculation Whoa, love says men get jumped into gangs usually, whereas women usually get essayed into gangs, so neither is safe. But I guess which, whichever you think is worse, personally, I'd rather be a man in a gang than a woman. Yeah, I agree with that. That's the thing. We all have different relationships with pain. Would we rather be jumped? Would we rather be assaulted? Would we rather, for me, obviously, I'd rather just be jumped. Like, being assaulted again does not sound fun. I'd really prefer that not to happen ever again. Um, it was far worse in many ways than if I had just been, like, I think hit. But, you know, doesn't matter. Like, who cares? Just pearly things. They like being cheated. I swear to God, this show has made me believe. I think women like to be cheated on. The WhatsApp. Ugh, Pearl is so annoying. I'm sorry, you guys are leaving such great comments. I hate this, but when I, but when I, as a guy, have been groped without consent, it kind of made me feel, makes me feel good about myself. And even though I know it's wrong, you know what? I think this is like the way I would have the conversation with myself. I would say, why do I get validation from people finding me attractive, even if it's in a way that is basically a consent violation? One, you're allowed to consent to a culture that um, just openly gropes you. I think a lot of people in different bubbles do prefer that way of being. They want to be openly kissed. They don't want to be asked first. They want to do all those things. And I don't think one is more right or wrong. I just don't want to live in a bubble where that's normal. Like, I don't want to reside in a bubble where you just kiss somebody. I want to be asked. I want to have somebody who's patient. I I don't want to be touched without my consent. But some people do. And so I think you need to ask yourself, like, maybe I actually do prefer being in a bubble where people don't ask consent before they touch me. Or maybe it's just this idea that's playing into this dark fantasy of, like, they want me so badly they're violating my consent. I think there's a lot of toxicity in – um unsavoriness around this conversation that tends to be amplified by people who claim to have an objective way of flirting. And I think we need to ask ourselves, like, who is the person that I'm in contact with? And what do they want instead of what do I want and how I express it if I'm the person making the move? So again, I don't think it's wrong to want to live in a bubble where people don't ask your consent first. I just think it really becomes an issue when we overlap between those two communities. So for me, like, I don't find it attractive when someone just kisses me without my consent. If anything, like you're not getting a – like I'm never talking to you again. Thank you. But for somebody else, like absolutely. And I've experimented in all the bubbles in regards to this. I've been in the bubbles where people don't ask your consent and I was fine with it. It just wasn't a vibe long term. Temporarily, it was kind of interesting and I didn't mind it because I knew I was consenting to a bubble. Like when I entered the club or when I entered a specific zone – I knew that was going to happen. So I was like, okay, I'm consenting in a, I'm already consenting to the not 
the not asking first. And I just didn't like it long term. Temporarily, definitely an interesting experiment. Long term, not my thing. You know, like just not my thing. Um, yeah. Tara says my boyfriend asked me, uh, asked to kiss me for our first kiss. I'm 25 and he's 27. And I really, really appreciated being asked first. His best friend gave him shit for it. Same. I met my partner uh, for the first time and we didn't kiss right away. And when we did, it was like we asked each other and it was very like awkward and like I'm a very awkward first kisser like I'm very bad at it and I don't like it and so like I don't like like aggressive first kisses like I'm very bad at it like ask my partner and so I need time I need like comfort I need a lot of like figuring out each other's faces so I think it's really lovely but again everyone is different is my point of a podcast ask everyone to rate their looks on a scale of one to ten okay we'll start with you go ahead Rate yeah, rate, rate your physical looks on the scale of one to 10. And then you have other characters that are peripherally related to discussions like these. So you have Abra and Preach, Sneaker, Destiny, Hamza, Andrew Tate. So where this video will be slotting into the discourse will be by providing a systematic review breakdown of some of the core truths, core tenets, so to speak, of the red pill, which I feel pretty uh, well credentialed in talking about. You know, I have some academic research in cults and online communities. And then on a personal note, so it's not just abstract academic theories and blah, blah. I actually have people in my real life, friends and family that the red pill has permeated to. And I've had conversations with these people. And so basically, their brain is in my brain. I know how they think on a one-to-one. -one. It's not just, you know, through screens of the internet. I have a personal investment in getting to the bottom of this. And so before continuing, I will briefly talk about what this video is as well as what this video isn't. And for the first is, it's more so not necessarily about the video, but the creator of the video, which is to say me. Yes, I'm aware of the dating app statistics and things that have been coming out of spaces like these. I'm aware that generally speaking, 80% of men are deemed uh, basically invisible, <laughs> undateable by most women. And then it's basically the top 20%. You know, what's really interesting is men in the red pill will talk about female nature, female nature 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 if you're all about nature and evolution and biology then isn't it just a re like isn't it just a result of all these men being lonely of evolution isn't that just life suck it up bro you're all the ones talking about evolution and biology and like what's natural well you didn't adapt so you lose how about that like, that's what I mean. Like, if you're going to play this game of everything is evolution, everything is just what it is. Again, people who blame other people for all of their problems, like, eventually, bros, you're just not smart enough to play the game above those people. Maybe you're losing for a reason. Percent ...that are considered viable and dateable, let's say. I'm also aware that it's roughly, you know, men will say yes to women on dating apps around 50% of the time, whereas women will say yes to men around 5% of the time. And the reason why I'm aware of this is because I already... I'm sorry, sweet dude, what is thoughts on slow unspoken Disney kisses? What are those? Do you mean like Disney, like the movies? Or is that like a, is that like a type of kiss I don't know about? He did a video on this topic, the dating app dilemma, so to speak, which talked about the rise of incels and fuckboys and everything in between and where society as a whole is going to be going towards. This video will be following in the footsteps of that one by providing a whole host of academic citations and research. I'm going to be synthesizing the thoughts oh, of many of people, Green. including psychologists oh, and evolutionary oh. psychologists and other academics. And then, of course, wow, we know way too many of those bubbles. Like, that's kind of interesting how like you really do stick to a side of the internet depending on the content you cover. I always think about completely switching sides of the internet, but this stuff is always interesting to me. So I just can't, but I liked how all those faces he showed, like I knew most of those people and I'm like, oh, we really do live on the same side of the internet, don't we? So I'll have my interjects of the red pill clip. So you know what I'm talking about, contextualization, baby boy as well as jokes, of course. And then to talk about what this video isn't, I don't know if you've noticed, but there seems to be like a whole industry dedicated <gasps> to- Who's Jake Hudson? Jake Hudson and their viewers just joined, say hello. Hi, Jake, who are you? <laughs> How exciting. Welcome everybody. Who is Jake? I'm here for it. Guys, we're being raided. I feel so special. Eating your own opinions back to you. And I refer to this as the confirmation bias industry. And so this video, like all my other videos, are not going to be that because around here, we're a big fan of the N-word, which is to say 
nuance. <laughs> oh, I thought it was going to be narcissism because that's my N word. I have no interest in placating to a side. All I really want to do is share my thoughts and opinions and honest analysis with you and then hope that we can have a civilized discussion civilized. in the comments below. And so that is round about everything. So please, for your boy, drop a like if you are excited. I already did. To Please like Leighton's work. He's a really good content creator. To go out on this voyage as we investigate the credibility of the red pill ideology together. When it comes to the red pill ideology, the idea of the matrix is probably the most compelling part to me, which is somewhat of a shame because it's the part of the video that we're going to be spending the least amount of time on, partially because I could spend a whole video talking about it in and of itself. And then partially because the thing that I want to spend the most amount of time doing in this video is talking about the red pill's perception on women. We're going to talk about the matrix a little, and then we're going to talk about the red pill's concept of women pretty substantially. So now mm -hmm. let's begin. Let's start with first principles what is the matrix? Mm -hmm. The matrix mm -hmm. is seemingly the conceptual word or conceptual term to explain reality or assume to be reality. The red pill's usage seemingly is derivative of the ideas and themes found in the film of the same name released in 1999 and that is seemingly derivative of the ideas and themes found in the allegory of Plato's cave released in... <laughs> released in 380 BC. So going all the way back so that we can return to the present, Plato's allegory of the cave is an allegory, an analogy positing that what we take for granted as reality is actually not. It is an illusion. So to blast through it in pretty simplified terms, there are people, prisoners, shackled to a cave wherein they are forced to watch shadows. And because the shadows are the only thing that these prisoners have ever known, they assume that to be reality. However, what they don't know is that actually puppeteers behind them are actually creating the shadows, creating the images, let's say, and those images are being projected by fire behind them, and fire in the allegory is supposed to be kind of like a false source of truth as compared to the sun, which is supposed to be the real light source. The fire is supposed to be a poor imitation. Now, Socrates, who is uh, considered Socrates. Considered to be the, the daddy, the granddaddy of uh, all of Western philosophy, proposes that if a prisoner were to leave the cave and try and look out to the sun, it would hurt their eyes because the cave is all that they've ever known. They've adapted to seeing the This is also a bubbles reference hello cave the illusions of the cave. So essentially to experience truth from the outside when all you have ever known is life. Hello, Bubbles! Lies would hurt you and therefore you'd probably return to the cave, the cave of lies, so to speak. And so, the parallel to The Matrix is that Neo, the protagonist, comes under the realization that he has been living in false reality and then he's presented with the option to live- Yes, but the- uh, okay, you know how I relate this to The Bubbles, of course, is the idea that some people found out about The Matrix and still wanted to go back into The Matrix because, you know, it's comfortable, the villain, right? It's like comfortable or the proxy villain. It's like this idea is also where I struggle, where when people on the internet, like, make a prescription, make a – obviously, if you're on my channel, you're curious about my thoughts and my values, so I'm happy to share, right? But also, what I'm trying to do is encourage people to recognize that, you know, maybe it's not so bad if people go back into the cave or maybe it's not so bad if people stay in the bubble. I think there's this narrative that like everyone should get out of their bubble. But like, guys, even when you have a preference, it's like a bubble. So going back to the consent conversation earlier, what if you're the group or category of people that actually want to be asked to be kissed first before you're kissed versus the group of people that actually want to be um, sort of kissed, like, just without the question first or earlier you guys um clarified the disney question which is like the slow kiss like the building up to the kiss which again so when we have this conversation and we're saying you know oh everyone should pop their bubble but what if your bubble which i believe it is is down to a preference i think a preference is a part of a bubble it's a part of an environment right whether you're aware of it or not you're making a decision to like exist as such so vegans versus meat eaters like there's no reason to moralize that even though people do but like what if it's a preference like that are you saying that everyone should pop a bubble so we don't even have to have that conversation because even fives have preferences when i talk about a five recognizing like everything is a bubble including like the universe bubble i'm just saying we're all in a cave no matter what until we recognize we're in the cave and then we can decide whether or not we're in the cave and we want to stay there but it's also always a choice but also not always because like sometimes you're not evoking free will so it's one of those conversations 
conversations again, even if everybody was a five, we would still have preferences and still end up in bubbles and still end up having like differences and arguments about those differences. You know what I mean? So we're not always vibing is my point, right? And so again, I think that's the real question we have to ask ourselves is do we have a fantasy of everyone, quote unquote, opening up and popping a bubble and being a five because we think everyone's going to turn out like us? Because that sounds like a two thought. A two thought is thinking when everyone's a five, then everyone will be like me, right? What about the multiverse bubble? Great question. I don't believe in the multiverse, but some people do, right? So, you know in the truth so to speak and that comes to him in the option of the red pill or the blue pill remember all i'm offering is the truth nothing more so we can probably all recognize that the whole red pill blue pill dynamic i feel like he should have told neo what was up because like talk about a consent violation bro he's like you're gonna shit in a little shit bucket for the rest of like your do you want to do that is somewhat of a false dichotomy it's pretty difficult to divide up everything in life and be like this is the true version this is the false version you know but i do think that there's something pretty compelling about it you know in the back of our like lizard brains we're all under the you know the esoteric the things they don't want you to know man mm -hmm. i think we all enjoy the idea of considering that like what we refer to as society there are these fabricated elements of it and you probably think this even more so if you've ever said something to the effect of like society is a social construct like embedded within that is this idea that we're all adhering to these rules and falsehoods that we actually needn't or maybe they're not even falsehoods maybe they are like that's what i'm saying every time you have a belief it doesn't need to be rooted in objectivity to be valid right which is why again like gender or orientation or religion like i don't need it to be a fact like objective for it to be a valid expression of society, right? And I do think everything is basically a construct, right? It's our making that doesn't make it bad. Do. And many of those rules are set by people that ostensibly are trying to oppress us, control us, keep us docile, obedient, dormant. I feel like when people talk about the elites, it's like a projection for their own parents. Like, are your parents trying to control you and keep you down if they're toxic and traumatizing? But also, even the most well-intentioned parents also lead you down a path of trauma often. So that's how I look at, quote unquote, the elites or the matrix. Like, you're just mad that you don't have a good relationship or figured out your parents. Because that's what these people are. It's um, I was watching Emma Chamberlain talk to Colin and Samir. And she was saying that, you know, when you go to the Met Gala or if you go to VidCon, or if you go to any kind of social event, it's honestly in the back room, it's all the same. It's like a bunch of adults with high school energy that are like, oh, that's the cool kids. And oh, some people know each other and some people have a crush on each other, but oh, I can't go talk to him. And oh, what if she talks to me? And no matter what you're doing, whether in, that that is so true to me, right? No matter what ends up happening, it's always the same energy. We're all just like a bunch of high schoolers with money. And then I amplify that all the way to, quote unquote, these elite people that everyone's so afraid of. It's the same thing. Even if you joined their bubble, you knew everything they knew, which, by the way, isn't even that interesting. The same thing still applies. It's just a bunch of people competing with each other in like high school. But they have billions of dollars. And I'm like, I want to compete down here. I have more freedom down here. You know what I mean? Like, again, if you listen to anyone who's made any kind of money or had access to any kind of money, it's just basically the same as our reality, but different stakes, right? So what's the big deal? Like, why try to play that game? It seems so annoying. And yeah, it's a, like high school. So they're going to smear you and they're going to do campaigns. Do you know the presidents of the United States used to do smear campaigns against each other during elections, but with newspapers and like word of mouth? It doesn't change. Humanity doesn't shift. Like humans repeat history. Watch my new Attack on Titan podcast for today, guys. Because again, Aaron Yeager is the representation of humanity's inability to introspect. We keep thinking we have to do these things. And yes, maybe in a determined way you do. And I really, I'm re I'm going, getting through Robert's book on determined, the book determined. I'm, re I'm listening to the audiobook. And I'm excited to finish it and kind of see how I feel about it. Because everyone's like, once you read this book, you'll realize everything's determined. Yes, I believe from my lived experience, anecdotal, that everything is determined until you evoke free will. And I think, again, this is anecdotal because I feel like I've had this experience. I know the difference between when I'm moving off of trauma and what I call biology and when I'm making a decision to do something outside of those things, even though you can make the claim that you can never 
uh, um, be beyond your biology. I think in practice on the micro, you can. And on the micro or macro, maybe you're not, but it doesn't matter because we're all playing a micro game. But I actually think there's something. I just think like, again, determinism is a bubble. And thinking you know that objectively, even though there's like science to back it up, is also a mistake because science is a bubble. Everything is a bubble of thinking you know. And I just don't think we know enough about the brain, know enough about biology. I just don't think we know enough yet. But okay, if you want to stake your whole life on it, cool. But I'm still too open to discovering what we don't know. And I'll die not knowing most of it anyways. So it's like, you know what I mean? Etc. Synonyms. Again, part of the things that I think makes the idea of the matrix so compelling is that most of us can look around in our lives and kind of conclude that we're, we're all kind of being fucked. You know what I mean? The education didn't set us up to do well. We're all kind of subjected to wage slavery. Rent's going up, but the, the, the wages are getting flatter and it's like, oh, maybe I'll have to choose b b b b b b between keeping the heating on this month or getting grocery. You know, it's not great. Some other things that I think are making uh, the red pill compelling to young men specifically, however, on top of the, you know, the things that we're all kind of subjected to is uh, what happens to, let's say, like low status men, and that's, you know, to do with life in general, but then particularly the dating market, you know? So there seems to be a kind of like, like whole discussion, whole... Uh, do these low status men care about the homeless? Like, do the red pillars care about the homeless? Are they just talking about guys who live for free in their mom's basements because they can't get a job or move out on their own? You know, who are these low status men? Like this low status men or whatever? Like, who is that? Like, is that like the mentally ill men or the homeless men? Or is that men who literally have a job, have their own place, and the only thing they don't have is a girlfriend? Are, is it those men? Like, who are we talking about? You know? Um, why do you think you will die before knowing most of it? What? Why do I think I'll die before knowing most of life? Bro, you could spend your whole life just studying, like, how shoes are made. And that could take a lifetime of understanding shoes. Like, you ever meet a person whose whole life is shoes and all they know is shoes? How to make shoes? What shoes? What material to make shoes out of? Like, Everything, what fashion brands, shoes, you could spend a whole life ne dying before you ever know about shoes. I'm saying I will die before knowing a, a, a drop of the information about the whole world. Red Pill alone, how many videos do we watch on Red Pill? And there's always more to know. Books I haven't read yet, Metasphere books I haven't seen or heard or listened to or people in the Metasphere that I haven't even like, don't, I don't even know their name yet. So when I say like, I'm going to die without knowing most of it, it's because you could spend a lifetime just learning about one thing and never even know everything about it. Cohort. Let alone all the other 8,000 billion things to know. Talking forever about the discourse about how, you know, dating apps have basically made it uh, borderline impossible for a whole subsection. It's not even a subsection when it's a majority. A whole majority of men to, you know... <laughs> love is off the cards for them which is why now they're watching like twitch girl ear licking asmr you know they're contemplating getting a ai girlfriend they're listening to fucking ai batman help them overcome their chronic porn addiction do not settle for a cheap and empty imitation of love you deserve real love the fellas are down bad bro a lot of them are really down bad and this to make it worse assault in the wound is against the backdrop of like the past 15 years where everybody's been like male privilege male privilege i'm sure there are like so many people that are like well you talk about this male privilege i'd fucking like some because i am suffering i should point out i'm not saying that i'm a woe is me guy but i can see why guys would be woe is me you know i could see why everyone would be woe is me I could see why everybody could be woe is me because everybody has it better than you and everybody has it worse than you. But all we focus on is that people have it better than us. And that's the problem. We're all, we all focus by default. That's your biology. That's your trauma telling you, well, everyone has, the grass is always greener on the other side. That's why you need introspection to pause those intrusive thoughts and to rise above them with meditation or prayer or discipline and to remember that like, Everybody has it worse than you and everybody has it better than you. The grass is not greener on the other side. It's just different. It's just literally different. More money, more problems. More women, more problems. More success, more problems. Like no money, more problems. So at the end of the day, like everybody got problems. And this like narrative that like somebody has it worse than you or better than you has got to be radically understood to get better. Comparison is the thief of joy. 
The only person you should be in competition with is yourself. Everybody else living their own life, bros. Oh, have you seen Fight Club? No. <laughs> so you're suffering away. And all you want is for somebody to recognize your pain, somebody to recite your story back to you. And then this bald headed man claiming himself to be Morpheus sits down on a podcast and tells you and the world your story. I don't think most women can actually genuinely understand how lonely the majority of men are. Yeah. And you need, you need to truly understand if you're Joe Schmo, <laughs> average in nearly every way in Starbucks working, you ain't getting a DM ever. Most men ain't shit. You know- Wait, that's just not true. Oh, average in nearly every way in Starbucks working. I don't know, man. I don't know. People be fucking at Starbucks, bros. People be fucking at Starbucks. People are dating at Starbucks. Minimum wage jobs. That's where everybody I know dates. Cause like you date at work. So yeah, maybe. But maybe, but maybe it's also just like your personality or maybe it's the fact that when you get a girlfriend, she's going to expect you to like do your hair different or like wear different clothes and you're not about it. Or maybe it's the fact that like you guys are bonding on the wrong reasons or maybe it's just the fact that you are like the blip in history that isn't meant to find a partner. Maybe you should just radically accept like where you are. Again, like no one can understand. Men can understand how lonely some women are. They are extremely lonely. But it's like, okay. So, like, sucks, bro. Like, that's the problem. Women are, so many women in my life are very lonely. You know, they have friends, they have jobs, they have homes, they, like, they're successful. But they're also like, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And I'm like, mm, he's probably on the other side of the planet. Like, he's probably not where you you live. You know what I mean? How many men aren't even willing to do a long distance? When I met my partner, he was living on his own. He had his own job. He had his own apartment. You know what I mean? He was chilling. Okay. He had enough money to come see me in America. And I had enough money to come see him in Europe. We dated long distance. We made a concerted effort. So many people I know are like, Brittany, I can't date someone who lives in a different state than me. Okay. Sucks. I'm willing to date in a different country. You can't even date in a different town over. I knew a guy who dumped a friend of mine. It was a bullshit excuse. But he claimed, I want a girlfriend who lives within 30 minutes of me so I don't have to fight traffic. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Like just, it's fine. And also, even if you're willing to fight that traffic, even if you're willing to date overseas, that doesn't mean that's your soulmate. If you are looking for a soulmate, if you're looking to settle, you could settle. You're just not doing it. There are plenty of people that would settle into a life with you. You just are in denial of the fact that like you're not even willing to settle. You're not willing to settle for these women. They're not willing to settle for these men. No one's willing to settle. But no one's willing to really look for a soulmate either. No one's willing to do it. No one's willing to radically accept, like, finding that partner and doing the work, but also the chance you have to accept that it might not happen for you. It is, like, the number one key. It's, like, you have to accept it might not happen for you because it can't be the end-all be-all of your joy. Being partnered means the consent of another person to live a life with you. And then it's not just them consenting to live a life with you. You then have to be a good partner. You have to be a stable partner. Finding a partner is not the problem. Keeping a partner is because all of these people work so hard just to get into relationships so they lie and they connive and they trick. And then when they get into the relationship, all of the ugly comes out and they're not willing to work on it. And then people leave them and they're like, oh my gosh, wait, like what's going on? Hello, ma'am? Finding a partner and getting them is the first step. Then you have to actually be a good partner. You have to work on yourself. Okay, the way they appeal to biology, maybe you're the genes that aren't supposed to be replicated. It literally, that's what I'm saying. If this is about evolution, maybe your genes suck, my bros. Even though I personally don't believe that, right? But like, you know, the, uh, let's see. How much money does it take to visit long distance partners consistently? Um, well, it depends on the long distance, right? But it doesn't matter. That's the point. If you want love and you are willing to like, build a life with your partner, it means buckling down and sacrificing. My partner and I are literally putting off buying a TV so we can focus on our larger goals because our past selves, our young selves would be like, just buy the TV, bro. Why buy the TV when that's money that could be put towards a bigger goal for now when we could watch like videos on an iPad or a computer screen? And I know what people are saying, like, 
but you have money. You have money. I don't have that much money if I'm still in debt. And if I don't have a house, I don't have that much money. Do you get what I'm saying? So yes, we'll buy the TV eventually when it's the right time. But why buy the TV now when I can wait? Because my past self would have bought the TV. My past self would have said, eh, just buy the TV. No, no, we're not doing it. Because again, like I'm being very serious about money this time around because I was never serious about it before. Being serious about something takes an insane amount of discipline, whether it's love, money, your job. Look at me. I'm so sick right now and I just want to go to bed. And I already took off yesterday and did a Discord event instead. And even today, I'm like, I just want to go to bed. I felt so nauseous before I started streaming. And I was like, I'm going to work. I'm going to work. Like I've made the decision. I feel so, I'm like bursting in sweats right now. Like I'm sweating underneath my sweater. But this is like, this is it. This is my dream job and I'm going to make it work, right? And so again, it takes sacrifice and it takes discipline. So again, everyone can have a conversation about like, oh, I want it. I want to be there. I want to do it. But like wanting to do it isn't enough, you know? It's just not enough. You ain't getting a DM ever. Most men ain't shit. You know that. If you think about it, okay, most again, men ain't shit. You can't say men never get DMs from women when you literally say you don't want women sliding into your DMs because they're in their masculine. I've always slid into my partner's DMs. I've always asked my partners out. I slid into my husband's DMs. And everyone's like, Brittany, you're so in your masculine. You're too like, you're too masculine. I don't like it. You know, blah, 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 blah. It's like, it's one of those things where I personally... I think it's so contradictory. Like people aren't paying attention. It's like Manifestel. She literally will say like, be the prize, but not the trophy. I'm like, girl, I don't think we're speaking the same language, right? Like I know what you're trying to say, but I don't think you're saying it the way you think you are. And men like Andrew Tate will say, men will never get a woman to slide into their DMs. Well, isn't that acting in her masculine? Isn't that what you tell women not to do, right? Women are the pickers, but men are the approachers, right? It's like, what do you want? I don't believe you when you say you know what you want. No, you don't. Because if you want to find a soulmate and you want to fall in love, you won't care how they did it. You won't care how they slid into your DMs. You won't clear, care where they go on a first date. Like, you won't care about these things. It's so superficial to be like, I'm not going to the Cheesecake Factory on a first date. Girl, they got cheesecake. What more do you want from a first date, girl? Go walk down the high street. Tell me how many of them stand a chance with you. Usually know. fucking zero. Most men are dead. Yes, Nail. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can't wait to see you in five unique sets of Teddy Fresh pajamas. Patience, Richard Park. Literally the dream. When you guys see me new Teddy Fresh, you know I've made it. Because <laughs> that shit is expensive. The shit is so expensive. You know? It's so much. You know? Seven says, Brittany, you're looking at live chat, not top chat, presumably. I don't like top chat. I never look at top chat. I hate that. I don't even know why it is there. I don't like it. I don't like tap chat at all. I only look at live chat. So I don't I don't know why top chat is even there. Like I don't see the function of it. So yes, seven, I'm only looking at live chat. Desperately lonely. <laughs> Desperately. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you want to sit here and talk about the struggles of life as a woman. There are men out here. The, the male suicide rate is so many times higher than women for a reason. Of course. The life as an average man is brutally on it's brutally depressing you emotionally resonate and then you think well if this man can identify the symptoms of of my pain of my plight with such accuracy such perspicacity if you will then all you have to do is continue listening to receive the cure you give increasingly people characters of the manosphere even more of your attention before long the algorithm begins feeding you more oh you like this thing well how about this one you tried operating under your own worldview and you've ran the predictions and it seems like the conclusion is going to be pretty dismal and so rather than continuing on with your own worldview you start to buy into their worldview you start to buy into their ideology and ideologies are dangerous for a variety of reasons but the primary reason for their danger oh old school peterson i think this is a hypothesis is because of their one-sided nature what happens is that they capitalize Parasitize, I think is even a better way of thinking about it uh, A profound underlying narrative, but they don't tell the entire story Weary traveler Be careful that in the pursuit of trying to escape the matrix That you don't become prey for somebody else's Literally Literally 
Brittany, would you talk to Tate if he asked you out? Do you mean like Andrew Tate the person? Like I knew who he was? Obviously not. We don't share the same values or agree on reality. Or do you mean like if I didn't know who Andrew Tate was and he came up to me in the street, would I talk to him? Yes, but I'm like, I only go on first dates and then I basically don't go on seconds because I just, I would just ask him like, what do you think about trans kids? And he'd be like, it's an abomination. And I'd be like, okay, thank you for the date. I'm over. It's over. Like I'm a very good now at sussing out like bad dates. Um, but yeah, obviously Andrew Tate and I wouldn't be compatible. We don't agree on reality. Which I would argue is precisely what the red pill is designed to do, to curate this hyper-specific experience, to keep you coming back for more, to guarantee that you keep coming back for more and to- Exactly. The red pill feeds you a victim mentality. Same like feminism politics feeds you a victim mentality, which keeps you like coming back. You know what I mean? For more, because it's like your dopamine hit of being validated. It's like the incels. It's like everybody else. If they give you a reason to blame other people, then you can always come back and back and back for the validation, which I think is a really important step on the journey, by the way. Being validated is so important. I know it was for me. But eventually, the validation becomes empty because you have to face the reality of reality. You know what I mean? Okay, guys, I love Leighton. And whether or not you like his hair doesn't matter. It is his hair in his bubble, and this is his fashion, and some girl is going to love him for the way that he looks, okay? Let this man live his life, okay? Let him live his life. You, in turn, guarantee that they have a funnel of financial ad revenue to keep them going, which, honestly, if I'm going to keep it a buck, is kind of a genius business model. It's almost deceptively simple because what you have is a captive audience mm -hmm. meeting a controlled opposition. So a captive audience is defined as a person. And by the way, I think Leighton is like very attractive. Like his bone structure is gorge. Let me just tell you, okay? Let me just tell you. Now, whether or not a girlfriend would make him groom differently. That's, you know, but then... We don't know. Maybe he's take, Maybe he's got a girlfriend. It's just everyone's into everything different. It's like seeing a person with a bunch of piercings and tattoos and people being like, um, what is that? It's like, well, for somebody, it's the vibe. And this is really interesting, actually, coinciding with like dating markets. There are some women that will absolutely not date him because of his hairstyle choice, which is fine. Right? Because you like you want to same. You know, people don't like my curly hair. Like, it would definitely be a reason that some people wouldn't want to date me or for my nose or whatever else. It's just, it is what it is. But like some people, they like what they like what they like, right? And this is important, you know, to realize about yourself. Um, and Confusion says, what do you think would have to happen in Tate's life that could actually bring him out of all of this? Um, um. You know, I just don't know, right? Because, like, you never know with people what it, what it is that makes them, like, fundamentally change or transform as a person. I don't know. You know? I don't know. Um, He would have to transform. I think he'd have to face himself, if I'm being honest. You know? Don says, I love how the internet is acting like ugly people don't date. Literally. I am so shocked that everyone doesn't know, like, hello, if average people are all getting married, what do you think is happening? Like, thank you. Like, as if ugly people aren't dating. Like, hello? Like, okay, like some, like, okay, everybody needs to relax. We need more ugly representation. We really do. We need to know, like, you can find love, bro. You can find love, you know? Person or people who are unable to leave a place and are thus forced to listen to what is being said. So obviously the first thing or the first caveat is the word force because they're not being forced in the same way that they were being forced in, you know, the Plato's cave way where you're literally chained to the cave, cannot leave, you are forced to watch shadows, let's say. However, because increasingly people are not experiencing the world firsthand, they're getting it through a proxy, people aren't having their own lived experiences and having time to make up their own minds. They're having it fed to them by other people. So it's important to establish here in the video that for many men, particularly the, I suppose the ones that we're talking about, their only interaction with women is through or these 
fucking podcasts. Because if you actually have women in your real life, you're probably not satisfied by watching these curated representations online. You're probably not watching Fresh and Fit, is my point. So, if a man wants sex, that's one of the few things that men ask for. You know what I'm saying? And if you guys don't deliver on that, you're, you're useless, I'll just be honest. There's a whole host of reasons as to why younger people are more susceptible. You know, there's the Dunning-Kruger effect, you have the anchoring effect, you have young people primarily being a so obviously like in the fresh and fit bubble, I think that's like a fine narrative to be like, if you're not providing sex, you're useless. But obviously I'm from a neurodivergent bubble or an asexual bubble or not me, but I, I'm aware of them. We're like, yeah, I might be aloe, but what if your partner's demi? What if your partner's asexual? What if your partner's not interested in sex? What if your partner has an assault issue? What if your partner doesn't want to be touched? What if your par partner has autism and they get overstimulated? What if your partner has ADHD and they get overstimulated? Like I am a neurodivergent person willing to date a neurodivergent person. I married one. And so obviously like, things don't work in the typical way because we don't want them to and we need them to work in an untypical way. Like just the other day, I was telling my partner, like, I'm so glad I married you for a slew of reasons I'm glad we met because if I dated any of these other dudes, they would make me feel bad for not um, being like available or the fact that my birth control makes me bleed for two weeks out of the month or the fact that like, you know what I mean? It Like it's not very comfortable to have sex on my period birth control and so it's one of those things where like we make do but it is one of those things where for other people this could be a deal breaker and I think again it's about agreeing on reality is the focus penetrative sex or is the focus intimacy is the focus getting off or is the focus intimacy is the focus coming like you're coming versus my coming like who is it's about intimacy and intimacy doesn't always have to exist in like pv penetrative you know sex it can exist in a, a slew of ways through intimacy. So again, like I feel really grateful to have married somebody who does share reality with me in relationship to intimacy, which is what's important is that we're together. What's important is that we love each other. What's important is that we're expressing what we mean to express to one another. And I think that's just something that, again, in the menosphere and all these other people, like they don't always have those options. They're going to make they're gonna their partner's gonna feel bad or you know those women who like go to bed with a full face of makeup or like wake up for their partner so they're more like cute i don't want to live my life that way i want to live my life relaxed you know in the Masayanic phase, which is a Piagetian term, you know, that kind of like, I'm young, but I want to change the world, you know, that like revolutionary spirit, so to speak. And so whenever you cotton on to these truths, all of a sudden your mind and reality automatically uh, changes. And without having anything to compare to what is being propagated on, you know, these podcasts and these, you know, your little TikTok clips, um, you can become susceptible to what is referred to as ideological capture, which is why philosophers like Carl Jung have bars like the idea that some people have ideas but sometimes ideas have people you think you understand something and then something comes along to smash your worldview and then you realize that you've been looking at something all wrong your perspective has been off my guy people exploit your lack of knowledge for personal gain law 11 from the 48 laws of power learn to keep people dependent on you you are dependent maybe not you in particular but the red pill audience is dependent on these proxy representations of i will say i haven't read robert greens work so i can't refer to it but i've seen him on a bunch of podcasts and what i've seen seems like really reasonable when you're playing a certain game but i don't necessarily know if it's healthy so laws of attraction like him saying keep people dependent on you that sounds like super toxic red flag to me but i can't verify it because i haven't read his books but his podcast he seems pretty reasonable but i don't know like hearing that right there i'm like oh that sounds toxic like what is that keep people dependent on you what does that mean you know what i mean so I haven't read 48 Laws of Power, so I can't talk to it, but I will I will get into the green Robert Green bubble. I've been really like again, I've watched a ton of podcasts with him, but I just haven't jumped into his books. Same with um Eckhart Tolle. I've watched a bunch of his like videos, but I haven't jumped into the books. And until I read the books, I feel like you don't know a person's content almost because their books are like sort of the foundation for their videos women and that specifically is the thing that i want to talk about next the representations the women aren't women per se or women holistically the women that they invite on these podcasts are part of the controlled opposition what about the president of paris do you know what the president of paris is oh look at destiny and sneeko <laughs> so grown up 
Bro, oh Paris is a part of the US. Look at them. They look, they're so little. Paris is a part of the US. And again, even though Myron and Fresh and Fit in general always say like we have women with all kinds of backgrounds and degrees and everything, but it's the same kind of woman. So again, you can get a hundred women who all have a master's degree in law, right? They're all going to be the same bubble or different bubbles all the same. Like again, the kinds of women that are willing to go on these podcasts are generally the same type of woman. Like my sister-in-law and I are totally two different kinds of women, but we're the kinds of women that would never go on these podcasts. Like you would have to literally pay me to come on these podcasts because I would never do this to myself because again, it's not good for my business. So it's not good for my business to go on Fresh and Fit because I don't want any of their audience. Like none of their audience is going to be my audience. So there's no business aspect. Like if they were like, Brittany, come to Miami and fly out. Why would I go? Why would I go? to what what like money biz like unless you're paying me what is the benefit of this for my business you know what I mean because I'm not the type of girl to go on this show and you're not the type of audience I want in my audience so I, I forget what state is Paris in because you said Paris is in, is in the U.S. Oh. Um, Paris is in the U.S. it's called Paris California okay London. London. Oh, yeah. Paris is in London and Joe Biden is the president of London and Paris. Controlled opposition is an opposition that is set up to create the illusion of an opposing point of view. It's essentially a propaganda tool. It's not a real opposition, it's just there to make the other opposition look good and give the illusion of an alternative. And in the case of the red pill, it's almost as if they say, here is women as a holistic representative. And it's like, no, you're just picking from a very small sample size. Same people, different faces essentially but your brain doesn't really paris texas too okay noted paris texas let's go realize that because in your head you're like oh well i've heard from hundreds of women they all basically sound the same it's like no you're just hearing from the same kinds of ones imagine exactly the same kinds of ones and a planet of eight billion people that's why i say like what bubble are you in like what bubble is this person how do they talk because again, there's a reason why the progressives on the internet, oh, I have to email FD Signifier because he came on my chat the other day. I forgot to email him. Oh, somebody do my emails for me. Okay, I have to email FD. But like he was willing to talk to me and I was like, oh, cool. Because like he's the kind of progressive that I, I do like his content, but also like that kind of progressive is different than the other progressives we interact with. So I'm like, oh, and it's like, what kind of progressive are you? Different kinds of progressives exist. What kind of conservative are you? They're not all the same. Like they're not a monolith. So again, like, what kind of women are you talking to? Baby boy, if you had never had ice cream before, and so every time you had ice cream, it was frog flavored, you would probably conclude from that, like, oh, I guess I just don't like ice cream then. It's like, no, you've just had one kind over and over again and assumed that there's a fucking infinite pantheon of other ice cream and that's why trauma and racism and bigotry and prejudice works the way it does because you have enough of an experience with one kind of group they think you start to think oh all men are this way all women are this way all this are this way all this are this way and it's just not true why is he making an analogy about of ice creams of women? What else do you want me to pick from, bro? I <laughs> shows like your fresh and fits of the world. They don't really care for having a representative panel because that's not the point. What they're doing time and again is A B testing. What brings the biggest draw to the show, and so that is how they've concluded. What creates the greatest conflict for views? We do love conflict getting eye candy you know people that are chosen for their exterior Ugh, i really want ice cream when i'm sick i always want ice cream when i'm sick but i instead of eating ice cream i got yogurt now i make the best yogurt guys i make amazing we call it mesta i have make amazing mesta oh my gosh my mesta is so much better than the ones you buy in the store because mine is like sweet and creamy and delicious and whole milk whole milk and like whole cream and like oh it's so fanning it's so good but the ones I buy in the store here, it's like, okay, ooh, I kind of want yogurt. I wonder if my partner went to the, we have a, we have a store really close by, but it closes soon. We're running out of snacks. No, we're fine. We're fine. No more yogurt today. I just really like yogurt when I'm sick. It's fine. I'll have cream of wheat. Listen to me getting hungry. Stop mentioning food raiders appeal as opposed to interior appeal these people are not being chosen for their incredible thoughts do you guys want a video of the yogurt i will make yogurt for the behind the scenes like youtube members because like yo when i make mesta i make mesta and commentary which is why when it comes to red pill shows i like my yogurt better than i like ice cream 
I don't like sweets very much. So I make it my yogurt even with like no sugar, just the sugar from the milk. Like, okay, not to like derail the live stream, but literally I am not a sweets person. Like I prefer savory or I prefer like neutral over sweet. So like I love yogurt to instead of ice cream. Oh, it's so good. dude. Oh, frozen custard though. <sighs> so good it's more often than not you'll find the panel of women being ig and of creators which is why they're willing to uh voluntarily subject themselves to what <laughs> is essentially a humiliation ritual of most of the women that claim to go on fresh and fit in these what these like podcasts i don't know if layton's about to say it but they actually do make a killing on their of which in that way, maybe it'd be worth me going on it. Um, but like they actually do make a killing off the same men that shame them for being on OF. They're their customers. Now, I don't want to make my audience that audience because to be honest, my audience on OF is really, really great. They're really nice and they're really lovely and they're very encouraging. So I don't know if I still see, do I want a fresh and fit audience on my OF? Probably not because my OF audience is so nice. Like they're just like the nicest group of people. They're very considerate. They're very into like what I do, which I appreciate, you know. I feel like if I got the fresh and fit people, they'd be like, why don't you do this? And why don't you do this? And why don't you, you know what I mean? Of which there is a big throffing at the mouth cohort of men that are overly enthusiastic about dunking on them, essentially. Like what part of me is it that takes satisfaction from watching guys that are prepped shit on girls that have just come to come and sit in a podcast imagine is that awesome? how many guys that is so attractive to imagine how many guys are like literally not attracting any women whatsoever all they have it's not even a part that is just them it's just hateful resentful and then they go into a show where a girl's getting made fun of and you know the girl says something but he's like no but here's the fact like here you didn't you didn't research like we did like that, that guy's gonna feel like some kind of fulfillment from that like yes like finally like they, they're getting put in their place and you may say that this is deserved because after all they can leave whenever they want and it's like no because they're not there to be an honest representation they won't leave because then they won't be able to get their bag up. They are employees, fundamentally. The key irony in this is that red pill broskies will tell you that female promiscuity is destroying the world, and yet they're exactly the kind of people that are propagating it and mm -hmm. allowing it to become profitable, mm -hmm. encouraging it mm -hmm. to be profitable. I've mm -hmm. never seen a girl get dunked on more than this girl on, on, on Fresh and Fit, ever. Like, they, the whole chat was just on her the en entire time. She got 12 hundred paying subs mm -hmm. in 24 hours. That's $12,000 a month. That's $144,000 a year they from sitting you. for sitting there for two and a half hours getting dunked on by the chat. And she, she wrote me later and she was like, yeah, it's totally worth it. I would do it again. That's yeah. what she told me. People always ask the question, why would these women go on this podcast and get hated on? All <laughs> it's our best friend, Abba. What's up? Because it's lucrative. So sweet. Love preach, love Abba. Some of them make a lot of money from it. They understand the game. It's a game to them. Most of those guys who say that stuff to those women actually just really feel negatively about themselves. Yeah. And they just project it outwardly onto the women. But if those women even showed them a modicum of attention, you know they would turn into simps. So oh, so true, Abba. Very based. Yeah. So they're doing all this, all these fucking whores, these fucking fine. whores. The girl's like, hi. He's like, uh, hello? From the 48 Laws of Power. Law 8. Make other people come to you. Use base if necessary. Red Pill fans are the people and the models that they bring in to dunk on routinely are the bait. What's somewhat interesting is that not only are Red Pill viewers a part of the captive audience, but the hosts are almost a part of their own captive audience in that they're routinely subjecting themselves to the mm. same kinds of people. So you almost get this kind of like self-fulfilling prophecy because of the selection bias that they have. Mm -hmm. All women are X, so I'll invite women that behave like X. They'll reinforce my beliefs that they're X, and then I'll continue to think that all women are X. You do not need to be an epistemologist to ask yourself, how do I know this is true? And if it comes from the internet, maybe that gives you another layer of consideration to think is this true precisely because maybe there are financial incentives for hosts and remember that these podcasts can't exist without guests a specific, specifically a table of guests they'll always say hey this is really hard you don't know how hard it is to get all these girls to show up to make it happen like they are reliant on these women to show up fresh and fit in the whatever podcast would have nothing like they would have nothing without these women 
getting you to believe in shadows, if you will. Glebus LA with a big $100 donation. So now that the Matrix has been explained and critiqued, at least, you know, well enough for the purposes of this video, we can now go on to unpack the Red Pill's perception of women and relationships, starting with the idea, the presupposition, that women live life on easy mode. Women have it on easy mode. Women live life on easy mode. Women. You, you don't understand. You live life on easy street, you know? You live life on easy mode. Women live life on easy mode. Women live life on easy mode in 2023. Um, well, ever since feminism came, I would say they live life on easy mode. So the Red Pill proposes that women live life on easy mode in two key areas, let's say. And those seemingly are... So did, is Myron saying that pre-feminism, men live life on easy mode and women lived it on hard mode? And if that's the case, are these same men that are saying they're more stoic, more reasonable, smarter than women, are they saying that women were smart enough to outsmart them to live easy mode and men aren't smart enough to live easy mode? So wait, is Myron literally saying that women are so much smarter than men they figured out how to live on easy mode or men are so dumb they let women live on easy mode? Either way, men are very dumb in Myron's world, right? are their accessibility to relationships, as well as it being easier for them to accrue value as a whole. Mm. Let's see, let's give the devil its due. Do women live on easy mode? Let's find out, foreshadows menacingly. So the easy mode of accessibility to relationships. Let's start off with this, which I'll say seemingly red pill ideology seems to substantiate that claim with a lot of dating app data. So just to blast through some of that real quick, most men are considered unattractive by most women, whereas most Whoa, 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 Leighton. Women are found at least. Most men are considered unattractive by most. How women rate men. Okay. Women, whereas most women are found at least somewhat attractive by most men. And then as a matter of ratio. Then why are these women dating all these uggos? If that's true, why is so many women dating uggos? Or average? Because we don't give a fuck, bros. We just want you to fucking treat us right, okay? When it comes to dating apps, there are substantially way more men on the apps than there are women in such a manner that even if there was an equitable distribution of, you know, for every one woman and one man leaving the dating pool, say, there would still be a substantial remainder of men there. There are simply not enough women to go around on these apps, you know? They're do you think Miami is the capital for their bubble? I mean, I think Miami is like their hub, but if you mean the category of girl they attract, they just grab all the party girls from all over the bubbles that also happen to have degrees or not degrees. But I think like, I mean, Miami is their hub, right? And so it is like their moneymaker. It's where they thrive. It's where they do the best, you know? Do you think size matters? Ab well, to some people it might, but I don't really, well, it depends, right? Because vaginas are like penises they're differently sized so if you have a vagina that's like five inches of ability to take before hitting cervix then a six or seven inch guy is going to be torture for most girls unless you like your cervix pounded which you know <laughs> so anyways so there's always that issue where for some people like it can matter. Or if your your penis is very, very small, it could be very difficult for some people that are much larger. So again, I think matching up genitals is probably really complementary to a sex life, but not necessary for a joyful one. So I would say that it just depends. Like I dated a guy who is honestly like so big that it just made sex like difficult. And I've heard a lot of men say this, like whether you're very large or very small, it's really difficult to enjoy sex with a partner because they can't handle it. And so that I think when you're in the extremes, it's very hard. When you're in the average, you're better off. The most guys, the more average you are, truly the better off you are. If you're averagely good looking, averagely educated, averagely penis size, averagely vagina size, like you are dealing with the average, you have more statistical probability of overlapping with someone. When you are in the extreme, you do have less chances of meeting with somebody. It's why super rich people, super famous people, and super hot people are less partnered and less joyful than the average. Because as much as Andrew Tate keeps saying, like, you want to be the top contender, do you? Because average people be out here married. Average people be out here dating. But it's people who are cynical or make their whole life revolve around dating that are truly the problem, in my opinion. Because, again, the, like, where's your dating pool? Who are you being in contact with? Like, who is your hope for – you know what I mean? Like, I'll meet a lot of nice people that are average, but they're also not – 
they are looking for like a soulmate, which is reasonable. But again, finding a soulmate, I think, is the anomaly, not settling. Settling is common. Finding your soulmate is different. And I think there's a there's a chance you might not find that in this lifetime, right? And that's a soulmate, meaning like at least a million, let's say, very compatible soulmates in the universe. What are your chances of finding the one person if you're monogamous or the many if you're poly or open, right? So it's something to think about. But again, you know, does size matter? I mean, it's really about like w w the person you're dealing with, you big or small, right? Um, I think that's really important, you know? There's a cock surplus, as Whoa. I said in the dating app video. And as I said earlier, men swipe yes on women 50% of the time, whereas women will f swipe yes on a man 5% of the time. Yeah, but that's okay. I remember, again, I was on a dating app. Like I was on a dating app and a bunch of guys had swiped on me. Every guy that I basically had swiped on had swiped on me, but none of them, almost none of them returned my DMs because they weren't swiping on me. They didn't like me. They were just swiping automatically. So it ruined my chances of finding someone. So the people that I was interested in, I was like, oh, they're interested in me. They were not interested in me. I was not their type, but they had swiped on me anyways. So I, here I was, my dumbass, DMing a bunch of people only to find out like none of them got back to me except for the few that did. And those people definitely only lasted a first date, which is fine. But okay, when you're an average w woman, like when you're a five, six, four, five, six, and the guys swipe on you, they're not returning your DMs. The guys aren't returning your DMs. You know what I mean? Unless they're very into your aesthetic or very into you. So like, again, women are also struggling. I don't do well on dating apps, but I do much better in real life. In real life, for sure. Like people do much better with me in real life. Like even, you know, Abba and Destiny said that, like for some reason in real life, I was more attractive. And it's like, yep, I thrive in person, bro. I look better. You see my whole body. People can see what I look like. They can see like, oh, like I just thrive better in person. And I that's why I don't like dating apps for myself. So a lot of women are out here struggling on dating apps too, you know. Okay? It's not that easy. I don't like them. I ugh, They're so annoying to me. They're so, ugh, I don't like them. Even my brothers are having a better chance at meeting girls organically, like through gaming or through their hobbies than dating apps. Because like everyone struggles on dating apps cry now from this as i think a lot of men conclude online that men are just the fairer more altruistic sex they're just more willing to give people a chance compared to women they're so picky am i right and it's like uh what's more likely is that women simply have more to consider when thinking about whether they want to have a relationship with a man whereas men evidently are much less selective you have the overall risk for a woman being higher when interacting with a man compared to vice versa and then as I went over in the dating app video and substantiated with the research of David Buss, generally speaking, women have more criteria in their mate selection than men do for women. You could say that there is a bimodal distribution for different mating strategies, wherein women's short-term and long-term wants for a partner are closer to being the same, whereas men's wants for a long-term or short-term partner are somewhat disparate which is why for instance louise perry said as i cited in the previous video women tend to assess like short-term partners and long-term partners based on the same uh qualities they want the same things in all the men they have sex with men don't do that they mm, i'm the outlier on this this is when i don't feel too much like a general a generic or a general general a typical woman I don't actually do this. I I am very specific about my criteria. Short-term partners do not need this. I don't even have to like you. Like, well, I have to like you a little bit, obviously. But I don't really have to, like, I don't always have to like a lot of things about you. You know what I mean? So I'm very different in that regard. I think this is what always made me stand out with other men and women is that I didn't have the same criteria for short-term partners as I do long-term partners. I literally have the opposite, the opposite criteria. They have a much lower standard for their short-term partners than they do for long-term partners. And so they will be willing to have sex with a woman that they absolutely would not marry. They would not even introduce to their friends. When it comes to relationship prospects, you could say that men are relationship scarce, whereas women are relationship abundant, or the prospect of them, at least. Which I'm sure for many of the disgruntled men online, they would hear that uh, problem and conclude, oh wow, boo-hoo, you have too many options, must be nice. I imagine for them it's very much just like, oh, so you're sufferings from success, but we should probably 
really investigate what it actually means for that level of success, you know? What does success look like when you're inundated with guys that are kind of like, yes, yes, yesing? Because I would argue, as I argued in the dating app video, that it's not for this, you know, genuine heartfelt connection. It's primarily going to be on a short-term basis. Most guys are just trying to get a fucking nut off, bro. Sometimes when guys look at me, they aren't really looking at me. They're like real-time projecting a fantasy onto me. And then I risk becoming their manic pixie dream girl and it's hard to engage. I want to talk- Sometimes when guys look at me, they aren't really looking at me. They're like real life- a real time projecting a fantasy onto me and then I risk becoming their manic pixie dream girl and it's hard to engage and I want to talk about various things. True. Talk about various things and be nice to everyone, but just because a girl is pretty and likes a thing you like, it doesn't make her a perfect angel sent to earth just for you. Being friendly doesn't mean I'm your destiny. I think a lot of guys do this. They have this like fantasy in their head that if only- Oh my God, first of all, I love this movie. And I remember watching it with a partner thinking like, I love this movie because, you know, it, depending on how you watch the film, he either learns the lesson or he doesn't at the end, but he doesn't really learn the lesson. And it's like a tragedy of a love story, but also so important to realize like just because it's a vibe doesn't mean it's your soulmate. Just because it's a vibe doesn't mean it's your soulmate. You know what I mean? And he, like, won't accept it. Like, the idea of being depressed after a relationship because, like, she left you. Like, I've never been depressed after a relationship ended because someone left me. I've always been, like, frustrated that, like, I loved – like, it Like it hurts to, like, have your heart broken. But, like, I can accept that, like, we're not meant to be together. But it's still painful. And, like, you try and you try. And it's like, okay, why isn't this working? But he didn't have that experience. He was depressed because he was like, she's wrong. She just doesn't know it yet. Versus like, that's that's the wrong narrative. It's fine to be sad over a breakup. It's necessary, I think. It's okay to feel like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't make it work. But the idea that like, she just doesn't know she's meant to be with me is so weird. They have a relationship with a woman that it'll like make them complete, so to speak. This is some I love this movie. Oh my gosh, yes, Snail. If I show all my partners that film and if they don't get it, it's not a match. I love this. I love. The difference between that like fleeting... Uh, limerence and then yes yes yesing everybody on a dating app also like let's keep it a stack you know what i mean despite women being inundated with a bunch of options of men um i feel like such a little freak listening to this being av uh, being an average girl i'm like invisible to most people what is the reality these women live in okay can i ask you guys a question can i be really honest with you okay so I'm the approacher. I've always been the approacher since I was like a little kid. I'm like the approacher into people's lives. I'm like, hi, I like you. Do you like me? Like I'm the approacher. Now, I sometimes get approached, but most men feel intimidated around me. So they usually like skirt around the fact that they're into me, which is like fine. And women too. They usually skirt around the fact. It's fine. It's called 500 Days of Summer, um, the movie. But okay, moving on. So I've noticed that like in my life, if I have crushed on a guy and I do not approach him, he doesn't approach me. If I am crushing on a guy and I like him, he does not approach me. I have to approach him. I have to approach him. Now, maybe it's the kind of guys I tend to date, to be fair. Okay, I do tend to date or have sex with, or in the past, men who are not, I guess they're not the kinds of guys that would ask women out, I suppose. I guess I am more toppy than all my partners, so that makes sense. But even when I was a bottom, even when I thought I would never, like, really identify as a top, even when I thought I would never, I was always the aggressor. I was, like, topping from the bottom without really knowing it. So I guess I do have a tendency to date men and women that, like, need to be approached. Hmm. Even though they always end up wanting to be the top, which is very ironic, I think, in a lot of ways. I think this is, like, the first relationship where we're more just, like, both switchy. But, yeah, like, even when I've approached men in the past... They're like, okay, but I'm the top, right? I'm like, mm, yeah, I guess. Like, I want to be the bottom, so sure. But now I'm like, I just want to be like a complimentary switch. I just want it to be symbiotic. I just want us to get along. I just want us to vibe. Like, whoever wants to be in charge today, let's do it. But also, like, who's in charge when, like, we're both just, like, living our life? You know, what does it even mean to be in charge? It's not even real. It's just, like, for funsies. Like, who pins who against the wall? That's really what we're talking about. Come on. We're really not sending our best, bro. Can I tell you what I want to do? What? I want to suck on your tits. Yours look amazing. Would you like to meet up sometime this next weekend? <laughs> hey, 
ain't no way he said, wow, that's hot. So now that we've gotten out of the way, this idea that women live life on easy mode because they have high, easy accessibility of getting- Do we though? Do we? Do we? Would you rather approach than getting approached? Uh, I'm indifferent. I don't care personally myself. Uh, I don't care. What do you guys think? Like, I'm completely indifferent to whether or not you approach me or not. As long as you handle rejection well, I don't care. Like, I'm open to either. Um, and I usually get pretty good feedback from people, especially from men. And also, to be fair, I also read this. I read, I listened to men when they said, like, women never approach me. I was like, okay, I'll do it. Obviously, because you're pussies. Like, all these men are like, I'm afraid of getting rejected. Okay, so I'll do it for you. But, like, don't you understand? But then when they do approach, like, a lot of them are bad at it because they're like, hey, you want to see my penis? And I'm like, whoa, sir, what are you doing? Like, I even had, like, I remember I was flirting with this guy. And he was like, um, something like, do kind of like made a joke about his penis. And I was like, whoa, stop. I don't want to see your dick until I see it in person. Like, I don't want a picture of it. I don't want to view it. I don't want it. That was, that's my rule. Unless I have seen it in person, I do not want to see it in pictures. So with everyone, like, unless I've seen it or unless we're like in an established, like, full on, eh, unless we're like sexting, but I don't usually get to the sexting stage unless I'm really into you. Okay, let me rephrase that. I don't want to see your penis unless we're in the sexting stage. And usually I have to really like you to get to that stage. Like for me to send you photos in a sexy way, like we got to be, I got to be into you, bro. I got to be into you, you know, like I got to be into you. And then if I'm into you, cool. But like until I'm into you like that, no, I do want to see you volunteer your penis. Thank you. Thank you. Getting into a relationship. Now we can talk about how. I feel like subconsciously you'd rather be approached since you're female. Yeah, I don't care. Like I've never, I don't get approached often. Uh, I think, like I said, men are intimidated by me. So I don't care. Like as long as you take rejection well, I don't care. I do get approached, but usually men do it very badly and I reject them because they do it badly because they're not my vibe. Listen, my partner isn't, my soulmate isn't going to come up to me and be like, how you doing? My soulmate isn't going to follow me around in a store. My soulmate's not going to send me a dick pic. My soulmate isn't going to kiss me without my consent. So most of these men out here that are doing the approaching, they're not my soulmates. I don't like, don't approach. My soulmate is going to be like, hey, um, I noticed you're wearing an anime shirt. I really like that anime. Do you want to talk about it with me? I'm like, yeah, you want to go to a coffee date or a burrito date? Cool. And then we have like burritos on the beach and then bam, that's a date to me. But again, like there is no like, I don't think I care about it. I think I'm completely indifferent to being approached or not because it just doesn't matter. Like the same result is the end. Are we going on a date? I don't, I don't care as long as like, if we're a vibe, let's vibe. If we're not a vibe, let's not vibe. So it just doesn't matter to me, right? Women ostensibly live on. I'm all about efficiency. Guys, efficiency is the key. Whatever gets us to a first date. So if you're not going to ask me out, I'll do it. And then you can reject me or not reject me. When it comes to them obtaining value. So if you've been in red pill circles long enough, you have likely heard this idea. I agree, Aurora. I think we should all practice approaching. It's good for character development. I think so too, right? And then I always approach on things we have in common. That's what I do. Like I approach based off of those things. Like, hey, we both like this thing. You want to talk about it with me more? Alone? In an adult way? Said to you like a mantra that women are what men must become. One of the things we always talk about in sort of the manosphere or the red pill communities is that men must become and women just are. And so your first question may be, what is meant by this? And to that, I will say men and women within the red pill space, their values are derived from different. How do they say like men must become and women just are when these men like have an expectation of women? Andrew Tate recently literally said like, you have to pamper yourself and go get your nails done and be pretty and work out. Ugh. That sounds like a lot of work, bro. That doesn't sound like I can just be who I am. That sounds like I gotta work. Things, and so for men, their mm. value is supposedly derived from looks, money, and status. Whereas for women, their value is derived from looks. The female peak, prime, whatever you wanna call it, is, is guaranteed, okay? Like a woman can be 18 years old, unemployed, eat shit food, lies in bed all day never goes to the gym and yet she can be a smoking hot straight 10 out of 10 okay As yeah this is bullshit right this is like a grift or this is men admitting that they're monkeys as a man you get to 18 <laughs> you're skinny you're spotty you're broke you're awkward inexperienced like it's it's just so difficult okay guys so 
that guy would need to put in probably minimum like eight. Guys fear rejection more than uh, women? Yeah, they do, which is why their genetic gene pool deserves to die. If this is about evolution and you're afraid of getting rejected, maybe your genetics shouldn't continue on, my bros. Okay? Like, if you're literally afraid of approaching and therefore procreating and therefore doing the most basic biological evolutionary, like, desire of the human, like, the human species, maybe you're not meant to procreate. Ever thought about that? Ever thought that maybe if you're too pussy to ask a girl out or get rejected, you're not supposed to? Or you could join my bubble where we don't care if you have anxiety or we don't care if you're like afraid, we'll still date you because as long as you're allowed to own it, as long as you're like, yeah, I'm kind of afraid, but I'm glad like that doesn't bother you. As long as you're not blaming the woman for being afraid. Do you get what I'm saying? Like the men in these bubbles that are like, I'm afraid of rejection also blame the woman for their rejection. But if you just accept it, if you're like, yeah, I'm like a little anxious and I actually have a really hard time like approaching women. Mo like a lot of women in my bubble will date you as long as you don't blame them for your anxiety, bro. Eight years of hard work in all areas of life to be able to see something similar to what that woman had naturally at 18. And this is how the red pill comes to the conclusion that women live life <sighs> on easy mode because as far as they're concerned, women don't actually work for their value in the way that a man has to work for his. Women are inherently born with value, whereas men, we have to roll the boulder up the cliff like fucking Sisyphus. Women are inherently born with value. These women think they're gods, man. They think they're like gifts, God, God's gifts to men. Like these women, like the, me, these same men put women on a pedestal and they're like, why do these women think they're like, they deserve to be on a pedestal? None of you deserve anything. I'm going to knock you all off your fucking pedestals. You're all fucking average. Nobody gives a fuck. And everyone's going to date you if you're just chill, bro. You're all fucking average. Most of us are literally average. Why are we all pretending we're fucking tens? Myron's not a 10. Andrew Tate is not a fucking 10. We're all fucking average or a little bit above because they work out. That's great. Awesome. Love that for them. But like, okay, like everyone is just chilling. And by the way, Myron is fucking unmarried. So I don't want to fucking hear it, okay? And Andrew Tate allegedly has a partner which I've never heard or seen, but that's fine. She probably exists. My partner exists, even though actually some people in this community, like some of my friends and family have met them. Like my dad's, my parents know he exists. Like my siblings met him. Like, like he's real. But Andrew Tate like has a partner. I get it. Okay. Anyway, the point is, the point is, okay. The point is everyone is just average in dating. I hate this idea that Myron thinks he's a 10. Why does Myron think he's a 10? Why does Myron think he's a 10? Somebody explain that. What does Myron think he's a 10? And if he doesn't, then why is he, what's he, what is the complaint? He could definitely find a girl who's like average or in his level. Okay. I'm sick of everyone thinking they're hotter than they are. Jesus. Bro. However, at this point in the video, I want to begin the takedown. We do need to glamorize being mid Aurora. Okay. Like everyone needs to chill. Of this tenor of red pill ideology based on some of their own internal fucking beliefs bro so at the end of the dating app video i foreshadowed this one this very video that you're watching right now with this idea of sexual market value created and propagated by rollo tomasi who is you, you think know, rollo's a 10 like why are all these men like talk, you know, they're all mid everyone's mid oh thought to be the granddaddy of the red pill we're all mid in and of itself and according to him according to the ideology at large men's and women's value are distributed bimodally and by age, which is to say that according to red pill ideology, men's value peaks around 36, whereas women- Tate is not a 10. Tate is a, because he works out and he grooms really well, I'm gonna place him at like a, it depends on what state of Tate. When Tate is a little bit bigger, like with muscle, he's kind of like a seven, a seven. Tate is kind of like a seven. I, I would say, <coughs> oh my God, excuse me. I would say Tate is probably like a seven, right? Like if you look at him, if you really, Tristan is much more handsome than Tate is though. Tristan is like, is Tristan like an eight maybe? At, at seven, eight maybe? You know what I mean? But like they work out, which really helps and they groom very well. So again, like if we're talking about aesthetic, like what is aesthetically pleasing? I think they're pretty attractive, generally speaking. But like Myron and Fresh, like Walter, no. No. <gasps> Wait, good point, Hada. He is kind of lacking a chin. Maybe. 
I don't know. It depends on your vibe. Like, it depends on what you're into. Like, I'm not attracted to Andrew Tate or Tristan. Like, they're not men I would find attractive. But that makes sense. Like, I'm not the kind of woman they would find attractive, right? That's what I mean. Like, men like Andrew and Tristan, they wouldn't date women like me because I don't fit their standard. And we all have a standard, right? Tristan is hotter for sure. Absolutely, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree. Tristan's value peaks at 23. What the, Where I peg women as far as their the, their peak sexual market value is right around 22 or 23 years old. 23, 24. 23, okay. 24, right, about, right around there. And the only way that there's any semblance of credibility in this is if you believe in this kind of like scientified equivocation, you know? Uh... Women's fertility peaks at 23. Ipso facto, their value also peaks at 23. The red pill ostensibly. Okay, so like if Brad Pitt was the 10 of the 90s, do you think Andrew Tate is as hot, is as, hot as Brad Pitt? Like if you take Brad Pitt as a 10 for the 90s, and this is very subjective, you think Andrew Tate is as hot as Brad Pitt? Andrew Tate is not nearly as hot as Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt at his peak... Andrew Tate, okay, Brad Pitt at 36 compared to Andrew Tate. I'm pulling up pictures. You guys are crazy. I'm pulling up pictures. Brad Pitt uh, in his 30s. Oh, Jesus Christ. Absolutely gorgeous. But also very different. Oh, wow. He's, okay, hello. Can we, can we get, mm, what's a good photo? Okay, hold on. We need to get better photos. Let's see. Okay. And everyone's, this is so subjective. Like this is, this. I'm not having the objective conversation right now. I'm having the subjective one. Okay, let's have the subjective conversation because like that's just how it works sometimes. Okay, so Brad Pitt in his 30s. Oh my gosh, this was, uh, this was, this was him in his 30s. Okay, this is a very specific look though. This is a very dated look. Oh, gorgeous though. Just absolutely beautiful. Just absolutely gorge. I'm trying to find, oh, the cheating couple. Look at them and all their cheating bullshit. Like, Andrew Tate isn't this handsome. Like, oh, Brad is, like, a very specific aesthetic. Like, he's got a very specific aesthetic. You know what I mean? Even when he's older, this is him older. Janan. But Brad has a very specific aesthetic. Like, it's very, very, very specific. This is him older. Okay, so it's very specific. You like it or you don't like it. But I think Brad in his peak was, like, I think most people would say he was, like, very handsome. I'm trying to find different photos. Okay. This is him. Oh, I love me some salt and pepper, bro. I love me some salt and pepper, bro. I'm so old. I love him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. I'm trying to think. Um. Okay. Hold on. And then body. We'll look up Andrew Tate body too, because to be fair. Okay, him and Fight Club, obviously everybody knows he was hot as hell. Okay, everybody loved him. Okay, he worked out. He like paid attention. This is him as the Greek god. Okay, fine, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Okay, Brad Pitt, blah, blah, blah. Now, Andrew Tate. Okay, that's not how you spell Andrew Tate, Brittany. Good job. Okay, so Andrew Tate. Like, he's not bad looking, but there's something about him. It's not the same. It's not the same aesthetic. It's like... Yeah, like, I can see that he works out and he grooms, but, like, you know, like, I don't know. It's just, like, whatever. You know, it's, like, a look. See, he's got this weak chin. It's fine. He's got these ears. It's fine. Like, he pulls off bald, like, really well. But, like, mm, okay, so here's his body. So if you're into it, you're into it, right? It's a nice body. If you're into it, you're into it. But he's kind of got the bigger muscles, which kind of, like, Look at, like, you know what I'm saying? He's just kind of nerdy-ish, but works out and kind of, like, projects a look. I don't know that he, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, okay, but he kind of looks a little silly, but not really. Like, he's handsome enough. Like, everyone's handsome when you're in love, right? But it's just like, mm, you know, it's a look. It's it's a look. Like, it's fine. You know, he's just kind of like a person. I think him working out is really what it is and him grooming helps. But otherwise, he just, I don't know. He just kind of looks like a person to me. You know, he just kind of looks like a person. Here, let's go Tristan Tate. Okay, let's look up Tristan. Okay, so Tristan's got a very different aesthetic than his brother. Now, it's not just the hair, but Tristan has a different look. Something about Tristan to me is much more attractive than Tate. But still not a 10. You know what I'm saying? Maybe. What do you guys think? Side to side. I would say. I would say. Uh, Tristan. 
Tristan is better looking, but why is he better looking? Probably smaller ears, bigger forehead, or different eyes. Andrew has beady eyes, and Tristan has more of an eye. It's probably just symmetry, to be honest. It's probably just symmetry. Andrew was better looking when younger. No, I think he looked worse looking when he was younger. I think Andrew's better looking older. So I will say, like, Tristan, to me, is much more attractive than Andrew Tate is. But they're about seven and eights. I would say Andrew's a seven, worked out, working out, and older. And Tristan is, like, maybe an eight. What do you guys think? Just aesthetically, just like aesthetically, though I like a bald man and I do, Andrew, something about, oh, actually, no, I like him grumpy. Maybe I just like Andrew when he's grumpier, but he kind of looks like goofy. Tate, I mean, Tristan looks silly here. This looks so performative to me. Ugh, I hate men in suits, P.S. I don't like this aesthetic on a man. If you look overly groomed or you're wearing a suit, I almost never am attracted to you, though I will say my husband looked really good on our wedding day. He looks so handsome. But like that's not my normal aesthetic. Like it's nice when you dress up, but it's like I don't want you looking like that 24-7. Okay, interesting. I'm trying to think like – again, I'm not saying like this is like the way you need to think or this is how everyone should be thinking or this is this is objective. I'm just saying like there's something. There's something like, you know, it's like he's just like a person to me. But he's not ugly. I don't think Andrew Tate is ugly. I don't think Tristan's ugly. But I don't think they're, like, very, like, outstanding in terms of aesthetic. I don't know. I It's probably symmetry related, but I don't know. Okay, let's go. ...actively treats women as though their entire value is derived from their ability to bear children, which doesn't even seem... Like an That's another thing. If you're only dating women who can give you babies, you're dating different kinds of women. Like my husband married me knowing that I might choose not to have children. But I can understand if you're dating someone saying like, well, no matter what, we're having kids. And I, I say that I married somebody that would be open to having children, which was really key to me. I needed to marry somebody that was open to having kids, but not necessarily someone that needed to have kids. Because by the time we got married, by the time we started dating, I lost my desire to need kids. My mom called me yesterday and we caught up. First, I told her that I got vaxxed. So now my mom knows I've been vaxxed and boosted. So that's a new thing. She was in a very calm Zen mode. So she was like radically accepting everything I was saying to her, which was good. But she also was like, have you guys talked about having a family? And I told her, I was like, I'm going to be real with you. I lost my desire to like raise children uh, during my diagnosis with fibro. Like I just lost it and I don't know that I'm going to get it back. And I'm waiting to see if it comes back. So I'm basically giving myself time, but like my farm brother just told me he's, they're having a fifth baby. They're pregnant. She's pregnant, but like they're having a fifth baby, which is like really exciting. And I think that's really wonderful. He called me today to tell me, and that's great. Like they're 30 and 31 and they've got, you know, four kids and one on the way. So five kids. And that's really beautiful. And I love that for them. And I hope, you know, everything goes smoothly with this pregnancy because it's pretty early. You know what I mean? But it is one of those things where like that's not my life and it's already not my life. I'm 34. I don't have any kids. But like I lost my desire to want to raise a child and I'm waiting to see if it comes back. But it hasn't come back yet. And that's just something that I've radically accepted. If I had a kid before that moment, we would have been like it would have been fine. But because I lost my desire to raise a child by the time I got married, now I just have different options. But if I married somebody that was like, you always need to maintain the desire to have a kid. That would be really hard for me. And that's why I didn't date a religious person because my my siblings don't – my Catholic siblings don't believe in birth control. I'm on birth control right now so we don't become pregnant. So they're going to have as many kids as, quote, God gives them, right? So, you know, how many white rural farmers even have five kids? I think a ton. They're in a community where everyone has like four or five or six or seven or ten kids. So they're in a Catholic rural farm community – and everybody's got big families. So I don't know. We'll see what happens in the long term. But yeah, like I lost my desire to want to raise kids. So again, when you're dating in bubbles, you have to know like who are you dating? You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> anyways, okay. Honest representation of what their inner thoughts actually are because most of them are not particularly interested in child rearing or talking about it it just seems like this more like a noble 
veneer. They're essentially saying their sex appeal is highest at 23, but they're they're trying to make it seem more noble, and so they're saying like, oh yeah, because it's the the, the fertility, because like evolutionary. Uh... Even if we were operating under this rigid evolutionary biology criteria, because according to evolutionary biology. Oh, good question, vegan. Don't you think that's outstanding? I just got here, but didn't you say there's seven and eight? It's pretty outstanding. Um. Uh, not, ob not on the objective scale though, on the subjective scale. I don't think it's that outstanding to be a seven or an eight. I'm from California. Everyone's a seven or an eight. Like, so there are California seven or an eight, which isn't saying much, but everyone's a seven or an eight in California or you're a six if you care about looks. Uh, so hold on. I was using my bias. Hold on. In my biased observation, California standard or New York standard, they're average, right? Because like, obviously, Mm, I guess they're okay. They are more attractive than the average average. Yes. 100%. Okay. Let me, you're right. Let me reframe that. You're right. Okay. Andrew and Tristan are above average of the average, but basic for the hot people. So they're the lowest of the hot people and the highest, uh, well, is a six, the highest of the attractive of the average people. So, okay. They're the lowest of the attractive people and they're there. And Six would be the highest of the average and one would be the lowest of the lowest. Yes. Does that kind of make sense if we're judging? You know what I mean? So I think you're right. Like there's something there because, yeah, in terms of the hottest group of people, they're definitely on the lowest, I believe, in my opinion. But that's bias, right? That's like what I'm, I'm reading them off of a lot. And I think they've gotten hair transplants and surgeries. So I think I don't know that for a fact, but I'm pretty sure I do judge people differently off that if they're genetically this way or if they needed to get work done. I think those are different categories. Somebody was a, a little upset with me for saying that. Like it's a bias not not to allow plastic surgery to be included. But like if you have to get plastic surgery done, which the average person isn't really doing, then it's not fair to say like to rate you up against the average because obviously you got plastic surgery done because you weren't hot enough naturally. So you got it done to not be average, but then that's kind of cheating so again, like I, I, for myself, like I'm paying attention to how many surgeries you've gotten done. You know what I mean? And, or, you know, working out is fine. It's within the natural realm. But what if you're taking steroids? Like, isn't that kind of cheating? Or if you're like getting plastic surgery, like, okay, sir, like if you're comparing yourself to a, a five and rule whatever, it's like, well, it's not fair. Those people aren't getting, if they were also getting plastic surgery, they'd be able to contend. You know what I mean? If we were all getting plastic surgery, we'd all be differently rated, but we're not. So I think rating someone who's gotten plastic surgery against someone who hasn't is kind of unfair. We as creatures, any organism for that matter, is supposed to do two things, survive and reproduce. Now, most animals do this until they can't anymore, which is to say that they die. However, humans are different in that we, we have menopause. Is eyebrow threading cheating? No, grooming is not cheating. That's just using the natural resources available to you. Which is almost like saying, hey man, your destiny, the point of your existence is not merely to continue having children. And because that happens across the board, an evolutionary biologist, one that's actually fucking worth something and not just like bastardizing the whole thing, would have to conclude that the reason that that happens is because it's evolutionary beneficial for that to happen, which suggests Women's sole role is not merely to bear children. And then tangentially related to that, even from like an existential point of view, like humans are not born specifically really to do anything. What's the, the Jean-Paul Sartre thing? Existence precedes essence, which is to say that you come into the world before there's a point to what you're supposed to do. We're all kind of blank canvases and we get to decide throughout our lives what we're going to do, what we're going to make the point of our lives. And so to say that women's sole role is merely to like have a child and that the susceptibility, the potential of the best chance of that peaks at 23 and so anything. Actually, one type of grooming aesthetic that has changed significantly how people are going to see themselves is teeth. Have you noticed how many social media people are getting their teeth done, like the caps and the veneers? It is significantly changing how we view teeth. We're like, you know, I know I have gaps in my teeth and I have like all these things, but I never thought much about my teeth and I, until I started seeing all of the veneers and I was like, what the heck is happening? And I realized like, oh, I've got to be careful not to sub subjectively, no, subconsciously uh, think like, oh my gosh, like how are these people born with such great teeth? They're not, they're bought. 
Like so many celebrities have fake teeth. So many people have fake teeth. And that's another example. Like, okay, you're not that attractive. You have fake teeth. Like, okay. Cause like I thought my genetics were crazy, but like your genetics are probably similar. You just have like fake teeth. So that is something else I've had to really like remember when I'm looking at people. Cause I'm like, what is this? Like, why is everyone so hot? And I was like, oh, never mind. You're all cheating. Fuck you. Thing that happens thereafter is she's like worse or what? Her value has gone down. It's like your fucking is stupid, bro. You know, I might be a blue pilled cuck, <laughs> but I think it's perfectly reasonable and defensible that we shouldn't tie women's entire value merely to the prospect of them bearing children. But I could be wrong, and I probably am, given that I don't have the same opinion as this guy. Like, don't get me wrong, once women get past 28, 29, they just, it just declines rapidly. By 26, it's all, like, the first early signs of her decline is showing, okay? You know what's wild? That's not even the worst of it. So, let me read. Yeah, so like, super red flag, right? You're not talking about real love or soulmates. That's a great first date question to ask somebody. Like, hey, what do you think about women's looks past 30? Like, if anyone is like, oh, she falls off at 26, like, literally run in the opposite direction. Because that man is going to cheat on you. That man is not going to value you. That man is superficial. Like, again, superfic like superficiality, being superficial <clears throat> is fine in a temporary relationship. But if we're talking about like law, love, soulmates, growing old together, even Jane Fonda in a recent interview was so gross to me because she was like, honestly, if I ever get with another man, he has to be like 20 years old because I hate old people's skin. When Jane Fonda is literally ancient, she's basically dead. And I was like, girl, don't make me hate you when I fucking love your TV shows. Don't make me hate you. But like literally so shallow for people not to like fall in love with the consciousness again Maybe I'm just like trying to fall in love here and I did, but like I believe in love. I really believe love is real. I see it in my parents. I see it in my friend's parents. I see it in my relationship. The kind of love I'm talking about, I see it in my brother's relationship. The kind of love I'm talking about, the love that will grow old with you, that love that will not leave you when you get old, the love that will wipe your butt if you get dementia or you forget to use the bathroom or you get in a car accident, the love that will not abandon you when you get cancer, the love that will literally see you through every hardship you're about to face because you both are symbiotically the same in terms of values and love for one another. Not the partner, the partner who will not abuse you, the partner that will not put you in a position to face prison, the partner that will literally take care of you in mind, body, and soul. Like that love, I believe in. And none of that love coincides with abuse, cheating, or ditching you because, quote unquote, you're past your prime. Okay? something to you right quick okay this originally was a tweet uh i'll show it quickly but i'll do my side if you're single woman over the age of 24 it's over for you a woman at her peak fertility is 23 after that she loses 10 percent per year of the attractiveness and desirability men also become increasingly repulsed because they inherently know older women have less time to breed cool you all deserve to be single and alone this if you hold this opinion and women aren't choosing you when you have this opinion cool. Then you know what I mean? In my Catholic bubble, this never comes up. You don't date women because they can have babies. You date women because you're in love and you adopt if you want babies or not. But like if you hold this belief and you're like, why am I single and alone? Because evolution didn't want your fucking genetics, bitch. I'd call them things so I can read it with ease and you can read it with ease along with me. If you're a single woman over the age of 24, it's over for you. A woman is at her peak fertility at age 23. After this, she loses 10% per year in attractiveness and desirability. Men also become increasingly repulsed because they innately know older women have less time to breed. <sighs> Fucking hell. Statistically, a woman has dated the highest quality man she can hope to secure by age 23. This is because high value men select for high fertility. If she fails to secure commitment and rear children with him, she will need to- If high value men only pick you for fertility, they're basically like calling you a cow. And if you wanna be someone's cow girl, go live your life girl, but I'm nobody's breeding like animal. I am not an animal. Well, I am an animal, but I am not your objective. Like I'm not gonna be objectified in this way. 
But like you do you. If you want to be objectified, if you're willing to trade your dignity for somebody giving you money when you could just make money on your own, that's the irony. Is these quote unquote high value men who go like, I'll give you money. Like if women are really willing to trade their dignity for this, like you do you, right? Like I don't give a fuck. Go date Andrew Tate. Go date Myron. Go date these losers if you want. But personally, like not interested. Like not interested. You know what I mean? If you want to go be a cow, like go be a cow. You know what I mean? But like not interested and I'm judging you. You settle for exponentially Gay judging. The lower value men with time. Women are a hyper deflationary asset class. You didn't need to write all that to tell us that you get no bitches. This topic. <laughs> Literally, yes, Layton, you did not need to write all that to tell us you got no bitches. Literally, so true. The same men, that's what I'm saying. These men are like, why don't women want to be with me? Uh, why don't these cows want to be with me so I can breed them with my dick? It's like, sir. ...of age and women's depreciation in value brings me to my next point. My next tenet of the red pill, the idea of the wall. P.S. I'm not shaming breeding kinks because I'm here with you kids. I get it. And so, so I don't run the risk of misconstruing what the very technical and sophisticated idea of. And by the way, my brother and his wife celebrating like the pregnancy of their fifth baby has nothing to do with breeding or genetics. They're literally just in love and they have sex and they get pregnant. They're just literally in love. They're making love and therefore a baby. They're not literally like trying to have a baby though there are times they're trying to have a baby but they're literally just like making love and whatever naturally produces because of that love making that's the baby do you get what i'm saying my brother isn't like we need to have this many sons or this many do they're just like whatever dude like making love having babies bro the wall is allow me to allow somebody else oh my god yes magic dragon i don't believe these men ever even want kids they want status and ego exactly they don't want to be fathers that's why they're not present in their kids lives they just want to have the status and ego. Their kids, their wives are all trophies. They're disgusting. It's like that one minosphere guy that wants to have five babies genetically through Japanese intervention because they can like choose the sex of a baby. You guys are freaks. You guys are literally freaks. You guys are like the corrupt kings in stories. And you're like, that's a high value man. You guys are freaks. You literally are the like the thing that we're trying to like move out of nature. Like we're trying to evolve past. They are the most monkey brained people I've ever seen in my whole life. They're literally the most like lowest comma denominator of introspective thinking. Thinking with their dicks. They're literally thinking with their dicks. It's so sad. It is so sad. But you know, you do you. Else to explain <laughs> the idea of the wall. That's why Jordan Peterson is higher because he doesn't just think with his dick, obviously. But he'll literally say like, if women aren't picking you, like... That's on you. That's not on the women, bro. And these men are like, it's on the women for not picking us. And I'm like, you are so sad. The wall is basically the part where I would say roughly around age when a woman reaches age 30 and so her looks... 28 is about the start of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about the start of it. But yeah. But I think 30 is a typical benchmark. And that's when her looks start to go downhill. Mm. Her ability... Oh my gosh. Me too, Colleen. This is a really crazy bubble. I love that my husband makes fun of them with me. Me too. I'm not going to lie. I love when my husband goes off on this bubble. He's just like, what the fuck? And I'm like, I know. Like, it's just so nice. It's so nice. To attract men <laughs> or the same standard of men that she did when she was in her prime, which is usually sort of late teens to mid twenties, starts to shrink. And at that point, her dating pool obviously starts to shrink as well. Mm -hmm. um, and really the goal for a lot of... Doesn't seem to be true, though. though. I'm going to be real with you. A lot of women I know, even older, they don't have a problem getting a date more than like girls when they're younger. The problem is finding compatibility, it seems. Like a lot of the older women I know, plenty of very handsome and attractive young men want to be with them and even date them, but they don't want to be with a guy who's like 15 years younger. Like, Have you guys seen those TikToks where it's like, nobody wants me? Seriously, nobody wants me? And it's like 20-year-old guys in my DMs and I'm like, Seriously, nobody wants me. And it's not that they don't even want you. It's just like everyone's compatibility levels are so different at different ages. And then why are you dating? Again, I'm really lucky I have parents that are together. I'm really lucky that I got to see love. I'm really lucky that I get to believe in love. Like compatible love, like literally not going to leave you when you get old, not going to leave you when you get cancer, not going to like, you know what I'm saying? Like 
that kind of love. Look, every love is different. And I don't mean to say like my love is better than your love. That's not what I'm saying. But when I say the kind of love that I'm doing, it's not the kind of love that Andrew Tate is doing. Because Andrew Tate will say, I love my my partner. He'll say, I love my kids. But like the kind of love he's talking about is not the kind of love I'm talking about. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about that kind of love. You know, I'm not talking about that kind of love. So again, when I say like the love that I'm looking for, I'm saying like fairy tale love. In the fairy tales, they don't leave you when you reach 50. They don't reach leave you when you can't have kids. In the fairy tales I've been reading, they grow old with you. You know what I mean? Women is to bag the guy that she wants when she's in her prime. So I would say that at the age of 28, you're pretty much at the upper limit towards the end of your best period to Damn. be able to get the guy that you want. I'm going to unpack this in a second, but why the fuck is it always the fucking crustiest dudes <laughs> talking? Nah, he's not that unattractive, though. Let's be real. He's not unattractive, though. Shit about women's looks online. But like, uh, that's what I'm saying. If you don't like someone, they're crusty. That's just like the reality. So all these men that are like, women don't find me attractive. They just don't like you. I like motherfuckers online. Like, what would you rate this woman out of 10? It's like three. And it's like, mate, you haven't seen daylight in two years, bro. Shut the fuck up. The resentment is real is all I'm saying. There seem to be almost like archetypal themes at play, you know, like class warfare. It's almost as if like the red pill sees women as like the privileged class, so to speak, because yeah. after all, they're inherently born with value. Whereas men, you know, the downtrodden, they have to earn their value. I always say on the show, privilege is invisible to those that have it. It didn't even come to your mind that I'm getting these privileges because I'm a woman. But women don't see it because privilege is invisible to them because it's so common. So it's almost as if like women hitting the wall is their comeuppance, which is why there's this like level of schadenfreude that red pill dudes have of like, this so like edgy fucking shadow the hedgehog shit is like, ah, oh, her time is running out. What the fuck? I think the saddest, most cruel thing is that a lot of red pill dudes don't actually understand that what they perceive to be this like unearned blessing that women have for many women is actually a chronic curse. You know, this idea that their value is intrinsically tied to the way that they look. And most red pill- Men do gotta earn their value though. In my bubbles, both have to earn their value. Like men and women. Like the idea that women don't have to earn their value, you all date shitty women. I've never, none of the men in my bubble would ever settle for a woman who didn't earn her value. In the same way, we all have to be symbiotically like healthy for one another. So I don't know what bubble you guys are in where all kinds of women get guys, but like, that's not what happens. Like my sister-in-laws are amazing. Like they're amazing women. They're educated and interesting in their own ways, educated differently, but still one has a degree, one doesn't, but they're both very smart. They're both very like, um, you know, they both are capable of pulling their weight. Um, one of them is the breadwinner in their relationship. And one of them is a stay at home mom who like just kills it as a mom. She does so good. She's amazing. So again, like my sister-in-laws are really amazing. And same with me. Like I wasn't just going to marry a dude who would take a, a woman who didn't earn it. You know what I mean? So again, like I don't know what bubble you're in where only men have to earn their value and women don't. But that's really sad. Like how like little you think of women or how little those women think of themselves. So again, like I don't know what that means. You know, are babies valuable? What age do they lose value? Great question. But you know what I mean? Like. I don't get it. Like, I don't understand, like, what bubble, like, is it where women don't have to do anything? I've, n like, is that the lazy people bubble? What bubble is that? You know? Horse, says, I keep trying to find true love. It's so hard. I've, I've dated young. I dated a 40-year-old in my 20s. I dated women my age. I'm only getting older. Well, it doesn't matter, right? Like, when you find them or if you find them. You have to accept that you might not find your soulmate. You can settle into a relationship if you'd like. Or you can accept that, like, you might not find that person because remember finding a person means them consenting to a life with you. So that's why like finding love cannot be the end all be all of your life. It just makes no sense to make finding love the point of your life when that's just like it doesn't make any sense to me. But I think so many people do that. So they get worried like live your life, bro. Like what's her name from uh, American Horror Story? She found the love of her life in her 40s. Like everyone is different. You know what I mean? audiences aren't going to be aware of this at all.
because of the kinds of women that are actually brought on the shows. Again, they're not meant to be representative of women per se. Not only do most women not make an income off of their looks alone in the ways that many of these podcasts purport, try to convey, most women don't even have good, healthy, positive relationships with their looks, period. And if you think that like beauty standards and body image issues are terrible now. Mate, the early 2000s were a whole different beast. Okay, Robin, now are we shooting for the large size category? Um, yes, Robin would represent- Oh my God, do you guys know this clip? This is a crazy, this is, you wanna talk about body insecurities? This was my childhood. And a plus size model. I think a next American's top model is not a plus size model, I'm sorry. So sad that you just kind of didn't put yourself out there. Plus size. You know, representing- She's plus sized. That's my childhood right there, baby. This is plus sized. Yep. Women of a different size. Robin, first of all, is too old to be starting a model. She's huge. It's clear that Robin doesn't have the personality to be a top model. Why are you crying, Robin? Talk to me, why are you crying? That's what I'm saying. Is this the bubble you want to appeal to? If this is like, they say top model, like, do you want to be a top model? Do you want to put yourself what you like through this to be the top model? You do you. If you want to get these high earning men or whatever, if this like I don't want this life. I don't want to be a top model because I would rather eat some fucking bread. I don't want to live this life. You know what I'm saying? And that's the question you have to ask yourself. That's the question you have to ask yourself. These high value men that are like women have to earn our, you know, whatever, or like women have to whatever. Fine. You do that. But I don't want that life, bro. Okay. I think both men and women use women's looks as a bigger, let's say, like, slice of the pie for what they consider their value to be. I also think this is largely why that, like, body positivity is primarily for women and not for men, as I said in the dating app video, which- Um, but body, po body positivity, like, could be for men if they would embrace their vulnerabilities, because, like, the men who I have, I really appreciate that energy from them, because men also struggle. To point it out as a kind of double standard, but it's a double standard that I'm not necessarily- upset by because i think what body positivity is ostensibly at least trying to do or implicitly doing is expanding the i don't know radius the diameter whatever that is considered um attractive and you know the red pillars might find this unfair but i don't think that you know what i think body positive should do is just like not moralize how you keep your body i don't want to moralize it including eugenia cooney i don't want to moralize her body I think she has the right to do whatever she wants with it, just like you have the right to be morbidly obese, just like you have the right to work out, just like you have the, like, I just don't want to moralize your body, dude. Like, as a person who's in the bodybuilding bubble, like, and I see a lot of these guys end up dying from steroid use, like, I will say that I, I'm not uh, happy about it, but I'm, like, you're an adult, bro. Like, if this is the way you want to have a relationship with yourself, like, you know what I mean? I'm not excited about it. But like it is what it is, right? And so it is one of those things where I feel like people have the right to do what they want with their body and that's body positivity is allowing people to like just like exist. Yeah, exactly. So if they're right to exist, you know what I mean? Just like you do you. It's the same way I feel about like even my body or my partner's body. Like again, like how we keep our body is kind of how we maintain our vehicles. It's like it's our ship. It's our body. We just want to have a relationship with it. And it's it's not up for debate about other people like my body isn't up for debate um you can have that debate you can do what you want with it but like it's not up for debate to me like your opinions don't matter you know what I mean it's my body it's how I'm gonna keep it and everyone has the right to exist how they do but yeah like there there really is this narrative for men and women on all genders I see it where men feel like oh women aren't gonna date me unless I have a six-pack again I don't know any woman in my life who is dating a man with a six-pack I don't know any woman in my life who's dating man with a visible six pack since the diet you have to have to have a visible six pack is usually a very dedicated one. Now, my farm brother is very in shape because he works on a farm and he has some definition and stuff, but he fluctuates some months. He's fatter than other months. They just love food, bro. They work so hard. They're going to eat food. So again, it's like to have a six pack year round, like Justin Waller, in order to maintain his like body physique year round, has one meal a day and he doesn't eat until like 8 p.m. at night. I'm Middle Eastern. We don't have time for this. We need to eat like 20 times a day. 
I grew up in such a wonderful family that was very critical about how we looked in the 2000s. Trust me, a few of my siblings definitely struggled with like food because like there was a lot of like you're fat, you're fat, no matter what you look like, you're fat. But at the same time, if we wanted a snack at like 12 o'clock at night, my mom and dad are like, eh, eat something. It's such a confusing world to live in where it's like my big fat Greek wedding. It's like they call you fat, but also they encourage you to eat all the time. What are you going to do? You're going to enjoy the food. Fuck it. Be fat. Fuck it. Be fat. Who cares? But also like, you know, don't be too fat because like don't be too skinny. It's like it's very confusing. Okay. It's a very confusing bubble. All I know is like I will not be criticized for eating bread at 3 a.m. Did that happen last night? It did. I was up until like 6 a.m., 7 a.m. in the morning. I was working and I was tired, but I couldn't sleep. Sleeping when you're sick is so hard sometimes. And I like at 3 a.m. in the morning, I warmed up a piece of bread and brought it to my partner. And then we giggled like little kids like he <laughs> were eating bread at 3 a.m. And we enjoyed that bread. I made it with my own two goddamn hands and it was delicious. It was delicious. Uh, they should, especially based on their own logic, because within their very own ideology, at least they can improve their status, whereas women can't, you know? Theirs will just go down according to them. It's almost like those cartoons where there would always be a scene where, like, the protagonist would get trapped and, like, the walls would be closing in, you know? And so, considering this, is it true that women live easy lives, that their lives are easy mode. I think the only way that you could genuinely conclude this is if you made the fatal mistake, in my opinion, that you misconstrued life or a good life to merely mean having more sexual access or being considered of high value by strangers. And let's say that that was true. It isn't, but let's run the hypothetical as though it was. Let's crack open the old mathematics, right? If they're saying that the wall is 30 and you're legally an adult at 18 and also your brain is only fully developed at 25 but also they're saying that by age 23 you've already peaked and so by the time even that your brain is fully developed you're two years gone. By their own logic you have like seven years to bag the best guy that you can and afterwards you're just like fucked because you've hit the wall. I'm no mathematician but Seven years does not a good life make. Keeping it 100, keeping it 100. Um, if I had to pick, you know, at the character customization screen of life, I would pick the same immutable characteristics every single time. This race and this sex. Back to fucking back, bro. Like, if I had to choose to be in a relationship with people of this generation that have been influenced by this fucking bald-headed GTA character. You know, me personally, right? So I won't date a girl who's older than 25. Bro, you go Moscow, you walk in the club. What does that mean? I won't date a girl that's older than 25. Like, when people say that, like, what happens to their wives or their partners? That's what I'm saying. If you're only dating someone until they reach a certain age, like, you're not having the same relationship with love that I am. And again, like, I don't want to compare our love. I don't want to say your relationship is worse than mine. But if you live in a reality where, like, you're dating people who are 25 or younger, like Andrew Tate is saying, and, like, you're aging as a man, and you're like, well, eventually, like, they'll leave, or eventually, like, I will leave them. It's like, okay, we're not talking about the same thing then. They're talking about, guys, they're literally talking about using you as a baby machine. They're talking about using you for status. It's a superficial, horrible relationship. Nothing about it is about love. So, again, if you're falling for Andrew Tate and his chick in this bubble, that's fine. But, like, what is real love? In my opinion, again, I am I know I'm saying real love, but, like, what does real love mean if you're going to leave that person when they age out of hanging? Like, what does that mean? Or if you're going to leave them if they get a disease? Like, what what are we talking about here? You know? There's a 60-year-old mafia ball. And again, real love doesn't also include abuse and cheating and malicious behavior. I'll surround by 18-year-old girls. Bro. Really? Oh, yeah, all day. It's completely normal. Completely. Wait, the 60-year-old, he's not with 30-year-old chicks. No, fuck, fuck no, he's rich. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's picking up some used up pussy. He's rich. No, bro. Used up pussies for the broke boys. Like, you know, he ain't playing those games. He wants it fresh. If her prefrontal cortex is fully formed, I don't want it. Am I right, fellas? To me, what it seems like is that to be a woman in the 21st century, maybe even ever, honestly, is to live in the prisoner's dilemma. Because on one hand, you don't want to be valued and looked upon merely for your looks you know you want to have your other talents and skills taken into account too for you know the judge of your character but then on another hand you relentlessly are so aware that you have to preserve your value what you look like ha, 
Magic Dragon says, so true. Women apparently have it so much easier and also have a value for like seven years. Like, like literally, what? Otherwise, you kind of just get discarded. Like, mate, I don't know if the, if the fellas are watching this, but like, generally speaking, women start using like fucking anti-aging creams and serums from the age of, I don't know, their late teens to their early 20s, many of them. And you are still using fucking two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. And you want to talk about motherfucking... <laughs> I feel like I've just about exhausted this section of the video, the easy mode part, and that isn't even, you know, getting into the criteria outside of the things that the red pill has its eyeballs on. You know, the other things that can also make women's lives hard outside of value. Could you imagine sleeping with a man that says I don't date women over 25? Like, listen to what he just said out loud. This is why I love my dad so much, because my dad would be like, what do you mean? Like, 25 is a child. Like, my dad, as he ages, recognizes that 25 is a child to his 60 whatever like hello but at the same time like I get it you want to like fuck the older guy it's hot but like I really respect my dad so much for looking at 25 year olds like children thank you my best friend's dad same thing he's like they are literally children not because they're disrespecting 25 year olds not because like 25 year old women are children because they're respecting the fact that like we're not the same it's a respect thing now to your bubble it might not be there is a bubble and I understand it. So I'm here to like validate it that says like, I want the 60 year old men to see me as a grown adult and I want them to want to be into me. And that's fine. You do you. But again, I'm from a bubble where I value my dad and my best friend's dad for saying things like 25 year old people are children. And like, it's my job as an older man not to objectify them, not to treat them like a piece of meat, not to treat them as a thing. You know what I mean? But I understand because, again, they're like, I'm an old man. I'm a gr I'm an old man. Like, I'm this is not. But I understand it's fine if you want to live in a bubble where, like, you're a young girl and you're into older men and the older men are into you. Like, you do you. I'm you're an adult. I believe in your agency. But again, like for me in my bubble, I respect, I think, older people that respect the age difference but again you do you you do you you do you oh my god but also uh one last thought on that is shoot i had it and then i went away shoot i had it and then i went away eh, what do you know eh, what are you gonna do and being considered attractive by people you know oh i'm sorry that's what i remembered okay now can you imagine sleeping with a man that's like i would never date a woman over 25 it's like that's so gross like that's so predatory and such a clear way to my brain that i'm like what are we talking about here things like having to bear some old men are hot exactly if you want to fuck an old man you do you if an old man wants to fuck a young girl you do you but for me, I tend to respect people more who like respect the age gap differences. If the person is 25 or younger or 30 or younger, obviously if you're in your 40s, like who cares? If you're in your 30s, I don't even care. But like if you're specifically 60 and you're like, ooh, 25 year old pussy, I'm like, ooh, ew. Pregnancy, likely being harassed by fucking weird, creepy guys from a teenage age the damned if you do damned if you don't uh are you gonna pick your career or are you gonna pick having a family the fact that women's default emotion seemingly is fear if you fill a room with men and women and you ask the question have oh, you ever teal. feared for your life what you will notice is that a few of the men's hands will go up each one of these men has a story about an isolated and isn't Leonardo DiCaprio like that yeah see Leo is so unattractive to me because he only dates young women Leo was attractive to me until I noticed that he only dates younger women and then he became automatically unattractive because it means he didn't mature with his age. Leonardo DiCaprio dating younger women tells me he didn't mature with his age. That to me sends a signal that he's so immature he can't get women his age. And so for me, like Leonardo DiCaprio is officially unattractive to me. I cannot see him as attractive anymore because I've associated him as like incredibly what I would call immature, right? Incident. What happens also is that every single hand of every woman in that audience will go up into the air. Now, if you ask the question, how many of you feared for your life in the last year? 
most of the men's hands will go down unless the isolated incident they're talking about occurred within that last year. And again, all of the hands of the women stay up. If you ask the question, how many of you have feared for your safety in your life in the last month? Again, all of the women's hands stay up. And the same thing happens if you ask, how many of you feared for your life in the last week? All of the hands will stay up. And this exercise usually shocks the hell out of men because this is the one thing that men do not understand about women. More academically to back up what I've just said and convey to you. Okay, but like I said earlier in the conversation, the same bubbles that might like um, you to just kiss them without asking consent or without getting STI tested or without birth control, like the, the couples that like might just meet each other and have sex, um, those couples who are heterosexual might actually like an age gap relationship much more than other kinds of relationships, though it's different for everybody. And again, you do you and your relationship, but the kind of relationship I'm describing, again, wouldn't have, wouldn't say like, I wouldn't date a woman over 25. Like what? Like your wife's going to age, my bro. Like, hello? So again, like you do you and your relationship, like Leonardo DiCaprio can do him, whatever. But yeah, the idea that like he can't find a woman his age is like a huge red flag to me. It could not be though. Maybe it's cultural. Like maybe he just, well, that's the problem. If you're identifying with 25 year old and you're 50, it's like, you know what I mean? Like, isn't that kind of weird? Like, but at the same time, like you do you. So if Leonardo DiCaprio can't find a woman his age that he vibes with, like, maybe that makes sense for some people. But then wouldn't that indicate immaturity? And then maybe it doesn't though. Like with 8 billion people on the planet, Maybe it doesn't. Maybe there's like some secret formula. Maybe he's more progressive in politics and 25 year olds are more progressive. And maybe that's why he's with her. Or like maybe he, you know, it could indicate something really bad or something really weird. But otherwise, it does indicate something to a woman like me in my category. So in my category, like huge red flag. But in their category, maybe huge plus. Developmentally, girls express fear earlier than boys and in a large longitudinal study of person. I just, Magic says, I just wish people would stop looking for a parent and their partners. I mean, amen. In the codependent toxic way, absolutely. It's like, ma'am, okay, like ma'am. But that's the thing, trauma be trauma be trauma. Personality development, more girls than boys were on a high fearfulness trajectory. Amongst adults, women experience fear more intensely than men. International studies find significant sex differences in the frequency, intensity, and duration of fear. Women express their fear more intensely than men, both verbally and non verbally. The only way that I imagine you can still have this conclusion in your head of women live life on easy mode is if you are making the equivocation that, again, sexual access and being seen as valuable for a very short period of your time is equivalent to living a good life. You are running a univariate analysis and your summary, your conclusion is fucking dog shit, bro. I would probably go as far as to say that almost nobody lives life on easy mode we all have varying levels of heart that's all it is and for the guys that i haven't managed to convince that are aurora says Brittany, have you seen the whatever podcast yes i have they actually list out good reasons why dudes would prefer younger women mm, from all the lists i've seen from these podcasts they never list out reasons that i understand like again every reason is a good reason right saying i just want a woman who's gonna have a healthy baby is a fine reason i just think it's bullshit it's not love um, why dudes would prefer younger women. I'm older than my dude, but it would be interesting to hear you talk on it. Um, if you can send me a specific link to the discord or something, I'll check it out. But all the lists I've seen from these other podcasts, most of them are like really basic biological stuff, which I just think is monkey brain, which I don't count as love. Like, again, if you're just thinking about your biology, I'm talking about romance, like a higher intellectual connection you're having with a consciousness that's like not rooted in trauma and not rooted in like a biological, like I need to make babies. And again, I'm being very judgmental because I'm judging it against what I think is like ideal love. But again, that's my bubble for my preferences. So I'm fully aware that this is my bias. Like this is my bubble. My bubble is looking for long-term growing old with partners. And so, you know, like saying like, oh, I like my partner because they're younger is like, why? Oh, they don't have old people's skin. Okay. So like, what do you have? You know what I mean? Like, I don't, what are we talking about here? Still adamant that all the blame be put on women, <laughs> that all the blame be put on women for the downfalls. Of I just get the same vibes from men who date younger women that I get from men who buy Ferraris in their 50s because they're having a midlife crisis. But like, you do you. Because I could be wrong. There's 8 billion people on the planet. I'm sure someone out there 
is having a symbiotic relationship where they're going to end up together until the day they die. But until that is the case, then we're not talking about the same thing. So again, if you're in a relationship where you guys date for 10 years and break up, that's great. I know a lot of modern relationships do that. We're like, oh yeah, I'm dating a younger partner. And when I reach a certain age, they'll move on with their life. That's you do you. But that's like not what I'm talking about, right? I think you mentioned it before, but do you believe someone can have multiple soulmates? I think there are a million soulmates for all of us in the world. When I say a soulmate, I don't mean like magic. I mean a statistical probability of compatibility and va va voom compatibility. So I mean like there are at least a million people per person on this planet that would definitely vibe with them in a really profound way for the rest of their life. But that doesn't, you know what I mean? Like that doesn't, so like, you know what I mean? I just don't think it's magical. Like, I don't think my partner and I finding each other is like profound. I think it's just amazing and it feels profound because our, but like our chemical brains are telling us that. But what we really found was like a love that's going to last a lifetime because we're the statistical probability of compatibility that makes us the best candidates for each other more than anyone else because we see each other so well. And so for us, like it is profound and magical and it is the thing they write about in books in the healthy way. It's like the story up, like we're going to be with each other until we die. And we found that. And for us, that is magical. But it's, you know, it lots of, you know. So it's like, yeah, that seems to be the rare thing. But I don't really think it's rare. So much as people don't know how to look for it. So that's why it's rare maybe. But I think it is out. I think there are like a billion soul, like a million soulmates really. You know what I mean? Of society. If you are looking for a collectivist. Uh, Miles says that, you know, men still get scared walking the street at night. Anyone can get it. Okay, but. Do they still do it? Because women are so afraid of walking the street at night. They don't go out. You know what I'm saying? Like men go out. A lot of women who risk going out at night, like that's surprising to me. Like I don't do that unless it's in a very specific place with a very specific vibe. Like do men like again, like not all women, not all bubbles, not all men. But like I know like myself, like I don't leave the house at night by myself. There is no way, even to go to the gas station, no way am I getting out of my car at night at a gas station. You're insane. I'm going to wait for someone to be there or I'm going to wait for another woman in the room or I'm going to wait for like the right kind of crowd around me. I'm not getting out of my car. Like you're insane. I do not pump my gas at night by myself unless there is a very goddamn good reason. And then in between pumps, I'm hiding in my car. So again, like the like the women I know who are self-aware of like around things around them, like no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Like, I'll take a walk with my husband at night because it's two people. Or I'll take a walk with, like, five girlfriends at night. But I won't take a walk, like, in a safe neighborhood. But I won't take a walk. Like, you know, I'm, again, again. Like, I walked home alone for my first time in Croatia at night. And I was, like, sweating bullets the whole time, even though it's very safe here. And, again, it's, like, what is – why? America. That's an American thought, though. I will say it's very American-centric. You know what I mean? This is why men are victims of violent crime more often. Women will avoid danger. Well, you know, evolutionary speaking, we're better at adapting, apparently. ...group to point the finger at for as to why you're in a state of suffering, let's say, or, you know, the world is... Oh, that's a better question. So the girls in the audience are saying, I do risk going out at night, but I have a weapon on me. How many men in a safe neighborhood take weapons with them? Because women in a safe neighborhood will take pepper spray with them. So how many men in a safe suburb... We'll take pepper spray, a knife, or a gun on them in case somebody, like, attacks them. Not in a bad neighborhood. In a bad neighborhood, I think we're all risking our life there. In a safe neighborhood, how many women still take a weapon with them? Just on fire. I'm sorry, how many men still take a weapon with them? Then maybe you want to look to the owners of the match group. I oh, wait, true, Bunny. I've never seen anyone say to a man, don't dress a certain way and go out that, that at night. That's true. Like, are men ever told, like, dress differently? Like, unless you're in a bad neighborhood and then clothes mean something. Again, it's like we're all susceptible to danger. It's like how the danger occurs. The people that own basically all of the dating sites and apps, which, just FYI, all happen to be men. My guy, my driller, my broski, all I ask of you is that you please stop listening to guys that are aiming to transmute your resentment, anger, and hatred into financial capital. Into money!
Stop listening to guys that fundamentally don't even like women. I've personally been part of the group of young men who despise, are resentful to, and hate women. And I look back at those times, the reason is quite simply that I just didn't understand them. And I thought they were some kind of different species that I had to learn to conquer because they had the secrets. They had like the sex that I, you know, everyone's telling me that I should really, really have lots of sex. Then they're not giving me sex. Age 18. Berserk music, let's go. Into 2021. 20, I saw he was that hazma hazmat has what's his name he's handsome well down the red pill rabbit hole and there's these periods of like yeah i don't care about women they're all stupid anyway like it's a waste of your time just focus on yourself king and then more phases of like yep women are all and i want to them and for those of you that don't know who that was that was hamza who is hot hamza pretty big in the manosphere scene and i suppose you could consider him to be a kind of red pilled person in recovery and i'm just using him as an example because intuitively you may think what do you mean the red pill people don't even and like women all they try to do is have interactions with them and to that i would say that just because the red pill spends so much time trying to teach guys how to get women is not necessarily to say that they actually like them and i think one of the reasons why a lot of red pill dudes don't actually like women is because as far as they're concerned women have so many prerequisites to even be considered liked you know the three sixes what is it you got to be six foot earning six figures with a six inch Otherwise, you're just fundamentally con Clayton. <laughs> considered low value. And even if you do hit that criteria that the red pill tells you to do, you may still not have luck with the ladies because, I don't know, women do this annoying thing where they exercise their own discernment and consciousness, which means they get to pick the people that they hang around with, and that may still not be you, despite the fact that you're in a Bugatti. <laughs> Bugatti? I did all of this and she still won't respond to my text message. <laughs> With that aside though, I do think that the main reason why the red pill doesn't actually like women is because women for them are simultaneously their object of desire, but also the reason ostensibly as far as they're concerned for their suffering and i think part of the reason why this is exacerbated even more is because i see that happen in like feminist bubbles too it does it really does happen in women's spaces where women are like i hate that i love men i wish i was gay i hate men ew gross i can't believe i'm attracted to men well it's like what kind of men are you attracting sis like let's be real like what kind of men are you dating what kind of men are you dating because I'll be, I'll be real. I feel like all of my female friends that are very focused on men, like are desperate for men, always date unavailable men, toxic men, men who like, men who are going to neg them, men who are going to like make fun of them. It's always from women who like want men's approvals. You know what I mean? Like those women are, are in bad relationships because like, why are you living for men's approval? In the same way, like, why are these men living for women's approval? Well, saying they're not, by the way. Both will be like, I'm not even living for your approval girl yes you are girl because primarily or first and foremost a lot of these red pill dudes <laughs> are businessmen and when you're a high value rich successful businessman you can basically get whatever you want because you have the currency to exchange for it however love romance intimacy connection i was about to say it can't be paid for and then i thought well it kind of can be paid for but you don't you can't actually pay for it you get a facsimile you get an imitation of and i think that's part of the irritation it's like i can have everything in the world and yet i still can't have which i suspect stings for a, a red pill dude because after all what is a masculine man without his feminine woman let me do the hand sign and i think this is explicitly why <laughs> the contrast okay women's biggest fear by some outlets, by some publications, is being assaulted or one of the other ones that I'll probably not include because it's bad, but you can probably imagine what it is intuitively. And then for men, the thing that they're most fearful of by whatever, you know, statistical blah blah or headline or whatever, men, by contrast, their biggest fear is rejection. I don't know if women have any idea how paralyzing they are to especially young men. <clears throat> A lar very large number of my clinical clients, but also young men I've talked to in general, are absolutely terrified of women because they're terrified of being rejected. 
and the terror exists in precise proportion to the retraction to the woman. That's what beauty does to you. It's like you are, that's why you're intimidated by a beautiful woman, mm. a staggeringly beautiful woman. It's like, oh my God, you know, attracted for sure, but definitely intimidated. It's like, well, that's because you aren't who you could be. Beauty does that to you. Because uh, so uh, because I'm not who I could be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, because beauty has that contrast. It's like... Oh, because, oh, wow, if they're that beautiful, then it, uh, suddenly look what I am. Look who I am. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's when you need a drink. Yeah. Or like 10 of them. That's when you need... Yeah. yeah. That's, when you need a re <laughs> that's when you need a relapse. Men have been terrified, paralyzed by women for as long as there have been timelines. Now, I do think radically accepting yourself to coincide with kind of my work on introspection... I do think most people have to go through the stage of kind of resenting men or women to get to the stage of realizing like it never mattered in the first place. I think a lot of us do grow up feeling like, why don't you love me? Why isn't any, especially if you don't have a, like a secure attachment, especially if you're um, very doubtful or you have trauma problems. I do think like men will start to resent women. I think that's why a couple of my brothers became like Andrew Tate fans because they weren't being approached by women, but also like they were being sort of rejected, which is very weird to me because in my head, like all my brothers are very handsome. I'm like, okay. But also like they're very specific kinds of guys and the average person isn't going to want to be with them. But also like they're average in a lot of ways themselves. So it's like, yeah, you're not going to want the average girl, but because our family isn't quite average, like we stand out as a family unit. We're very unique, right? Like having parents that talk to you about philosophy and your ideas and your worldviews at such a young age makes you just like a little bit more introspective than the average person. And then on top of that, they they do think about things like they want to have conversations with their partners they want to find women they can talk to and the average let's say woman in their in her 20s isn't interested in philosophy or introspection otherwise my channel would have more women on it I mean my channel is mostly women but I'd be more popular like obviously that's just the reality is like not like the average woman and the average man, they're not into philosophy. They're not into real philosophy. They're not into actual introspection. What they're into is competition. So women will join feminist groups and become more competitive. And men will join menosphere groups and become more competitive. But like researching real introspection is about humility, right? So like, again, do you want an Uncle Iroh or do you want the Fire Lord as your husband? Do you want an Uncle Iroh or do you want the Fire Lord? Because if you want the Fire Lord, date Andrew Tate. If you want Uncle Iroh, you have to fall in love with the consciousness who's going to treat you with dignity. And I think that this has been somewhat demonstrated. And by the way, my I think my siblings that are into Andrew Tate are sort of like, one of them in particular, I think is going down more of a route of being like, well, if I'm not going to find the love of my life, I'm going to be the fire lord because at least he's a badass. Yeah, he is. But he's also a shitty person. So maybe recontextualize like your whole life not being about women. Maybe that, you know? ...traded in myth. And so, cast your mind, come with me, dear viewer. Let us go into a little bit of a thought experiment. Sorry, same with Azula, where like Azula goes on the Fire Nation. Oh my God, my sickness is driving me crazy right now, sorry. Azula goes to the beach episode and Azula has a hard time getting a boy to like her. And same thing, since boys won't like her, she'll just be the toughest, scariest woman in the room. Yes, women, if you go living your life being like, why don't men like me? Maybe you're Azula. Maybe you're fucking crazy, but also, you know what I'm saying? This, what I'm about to say next, isn't necessarily the kind of uh, canonical interpretation of this myth, but you know, let's play around. Is there such a thing as a canonical? What about a balance between both? No. The balance is with Uncle Iroh. There is no balance between being the Fire Lord and being Uncle Iroh. Like, the Uncle Iroh is a badass. He is a badass. He's he's amazingly wise he's very he has humility and he's kind like the fire lord is just all of evil he's not close to joy he has no balance he has nothing he might be a badass but like uncle iroh is also a badass so like you don't even need to go to the fire lord you can find uncle iroh's the full package he's a badass and he's kind and compassionate full interpretation in the first place you know art is to be interpreted but the fire lord isn't the full package that's the difference He's only a good firebender. That's it. And a good um, strategist for military when it comes to like subjugation of other people. Anyway, what up? Think about, say, the myth of Medusa. We have a ostensibly, okay, a kind of woman, you know, long, feminine hair, caveat. Um, Ripley says, damn, I can't believe you're going to make me watch anime to better understand your philosophical references. Good news. Avatar The Last Airbender isn't an anime. It's just a really good cartoon and you should watch it. But you could also watch anime if you want to know the rest. The hair is made out of snakes and being looked upon by her, making eye contact with her turns you to stone. Metaphorically speaking, symbolically speaking, it paralyzes you. 
because men are terrified of women. Within that myth, Perseus uh, cuts this broads... <laughs> cuts this broad's head off. And I think in some manner, this is somewhat of a tenuous link, a tenuous metaphor, so to speak, but I think in some manner, this is almost what red pill content does. It kind of like takes a woman that they're both simultaneously scared of and aroused by and symbolically <laughs> cuts her head off. Let me give you some examples. So we have a channel called Modern Women Archives, wherein there is a title of a video called Entitled Woman Gets Rejected and Blocked Before Her Date. First of all, you don't need the apostrophe after the gets. It's not possessive, despite the fact that many red-pilled men are possessive. Banter. And then we also have Woman Hits the Wall and Starts to Cry, as well as When Women Regret Feminism and Start to Cry. I'm sensing a pattern here there does seem to be a kind of schadenfreude aspect you know there seems to be so much more enjoyment to seeing women in pain than actually having a woman say on your arm as you skip through the park on your merry little way maybe if you weren't as uh you know focused on seeing women upset and in pain maybe you could actually materialize a relationship with one. Also from a channel called Alpha Male Strategies, the thumbnail suggests that you should dump her today, King. And then you also have statements such as women bring no value, as well as how to attract more women. So, you know, which one is it going to be? Why are you fundamentally trying to attract things that supposedly have no value? That seems a bit redundant. That seems like a bit of a contradiction. No. Again, like attracts like. Therefore, if you are coming to the conclusion that women have no value, maybe it is because you also bring no value. I do think, however, a substantial reason as to why red-pilled men don't like women is one of the things that we already went over earlier in regard to, you know, this idea that women live life on easy mode, which you can only really come to that conclusion. True, G. The Fire Lord would be more attractive to unhealed women. I agree. I agree with that, you know? Many women see kindness as a weakness. Yeah, I think that's trauma. That's what I mean. I think it's trauma, dude. You need to pay attention to why you're attracted to certain men or certain people, certain women, like, why are you in certain relationships? That's why I like question age gap relationships that, that are like, again, if the person's in their 20s and you're in your 40s or more, I'm questioning it because I'm like, why are you in this relationship dynamic? Like, is there a reason? Do you have like a healthy reason? And often it is a, it is a consequence of trauma. And so again, when I'm looking at relationship dynamic dynamics, I'm like, what kind of women are attracted to Andrew Tate, where he literally says to them, like the most objectifying things and talks about people in such an objectifying way, right? What are the people doing in these relationships? Why are all my girlfriends who are struggling, like always worried about what men think about them? And it always goes back to trauma. Now, to be fair, people tell me usually about the intricacies of their attraction. Like, you know, I just feel like, why don't men think I'm good enough? Why don't women think I'm good enough? The moment you ask yourself that question, you are putting so much responsibility on the validation of other people. And that doesn't make any sense to me unless you think there's something like seriously wrong with you. That's like seriously wrong with you. You know what I'm saying? In that case, then it is therapy you need or some sort of intervention by a professional. And so that's something you need to consider. Like, again, I think uh, the only person you should be in competition with is yourself. And the only person you should build a life with is a person that makes sense for your life and vice versa. It should be symbiotic. It should be truly what works for you unless you are in a horrible position in life, unless you are literally in a slave oriented position, unless you are in the worst position in life being forced to be married off or something. If you are making this choice, you should make a choice that works for your life. And again, like, why are you so desperate to fall in love? Why are you so desperate to be loved? It's like, what does that mean? Why, do you, why are you so desperate to settle? Like, what does that mean? I would just ask myself those questions. Like, oh, if I'm having this, why am I having this? Like, why do I have this anxiety over being alone? Like, what, what does alone mean? What does it mean to be alone? Again, I just think we should ask ourselves these questions and don't moralize it. Just ask yourself, like, hmm, maybe I should consider that more. Like, maybe I should think about, like, why do I have this desire? Why do I think pumpkin pie is my favorite pie? Have I tried all the pies? Oh my God, what if I have a, like, what if pumpkin pie isn't my favorite kind of pie? Just ask yourself those questions. And again, find the real answers, not the answer you've convinced yourself is true. Find the answer that it's actually true and then change your destiny. If you don't actually understand or even care to understand women's experiences. But then I also think a substantial reason as to why red-pilled men don't actually like women is because within red-pill culture, you're supposed to be seemingly 
hard and masculine and stoic basically at all times and so whilst the red pill will say things like women are emotional creatures you sound like a fucking idiot why are you calling a woman a creature bro you sound fucking weird anyway women are emotional creatures and yet they will disallow themselves inhibit themselves from even being able to connect with a woman on an emotional level in case they lose their masculine frame. Bitch, if you're scared to lose your masculine frame, you probably never had it to begin with. Men seem so terrified of women in this regard that seemingly the only times in which they're willing to actually share their feelings and emotions, and sometimes even respect, is with other men. Welcome back to the Red Pill Podcast. Red Pill Podcast. <laughs> I only hang out with men. <laughs> it's not gay. Just, <laughs> it's just uh, all the women I've ever met have hurt me to the point of tears. <laughs> so I refuse to be around them anymore. So now I just have sex with dudes. Oh, yeah. No more hurt. I don't even like it, but it's like, I just ha I have to get it out. I have a tweet for you, dear viewer. Just because you are sexually attracted to women doesn't mean you are romantically attracted to them. A lot of men are sexually attracted to women yet clearly hate them while only praising other men. A lot of these dudes are heterosexual yet bromantic, homosexual, if you will. Follow okay, great point. That's why in my community, in my bubble, we talk about whether you're actually like romantically attracted to people or sexually attracted to people, which is very difficult. It was really hard for me to adapt to that change in language, but it actually has really helped me in the long term where I'm like, oh yeah, I find like a lot of people are like, a lot of straight women are like sexually into women, but romantically not into women. That's why when I dated women, I would ask them like, would you marry a woman or would you always need a man? Like I'm gay enough that if I had married a woman, I would, I would never have missed a man. But a lot of women are more than willing to eat box, but they're not willing to marry box. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like to use fresh and fit language, I don't really say box normally. That's the internet word. But like, okay, that's a different bubble. But like literally that's the thing that I looked for when I was dating women. That would be a first date question for me. Like if we got married, would you miss men? And if they said yes, I would be like, thank you for this date. It's over. Because like, obviously I'm bisexual and I married a man and he always asks me, like that was one of our dating questions. Like, if you marry me, are you going to miss women? And I'm like, not in a real way. So no, like not in a real way, right? Because like as a pansexual person, there is this narrative, but I'm falling in love with a consciousness, right? I'm falling in love with like, you regardless of your gender. I'm falling in love with a consciousness, right? So whether it was a woman who came first or a man or a non-binary, it didn't matter. Like, it, what mattered is that I was in love with you and I'm not looking at anybody else because I'm monogamous and I'm deciding to dedicate my life to our life together. So again, like, I think this is a really good question to ask yourself. Like, are you into women enough to like have a life with them? Or do you just like, are you into them only f until you nut? Following up that uh, debatably pedestrian observation, I'll follow the- And says, listening to this as a woman in her 20s who has a massive crush on a man in her 40s. I mean, crush away, girl. You can date away. I'm not going to like moralize. Well, I'm not going to judge fully you dating somebody with an age gap. Like if you're in your 20s and they're in their 40s, like you do you just ask yourself the question of like, where am I really at in my life? And why is this person who's double my age interested in somebody like me and where I'm at in my life? And if it's a healthy answer, great. If it's an unhealthy answer, red flag. That's like it's a yellow flag, right? I'm not going to like people can do what they're going to do. But like, are you 23 and they're 43? Like, that's really weird. But like, you know, like 8 billion people on the planet, maybe it works for you. The idea is like, are you crushing on them because it's sexual and hot and sexy? Like for sure, have some sex and move on. But if you're talking about like growing old with them, again, like what are you guys like compatible? What is the compatibility? Are they going to grow old with you? Are you going to grow old with them? Are you okay with being like, 20 years younger than them so like when they reach older age like Bruce Willis and his wife like he has dementia and she has to take care of him for the rest of his life which is great because like that's love right there but also like I think it's weird when men in their 60s are dating 20 year olds because like what are you doing but also like you do you it's like it could work out you know don't don't take my word for it try it see if it works but just ask like just find out why is this man in his 40s why would he be interested in you if he is or just like have a crush and have fun, you know, enjoy your life. That hood classic up with something a bit more academic. So, 
To say that straight men are heterosexual is only to say that they engage in sex, fucking exclusively with the other sex, i.e. Keep in mind, Myron is the kind of guy that doesn't think you should confide in your woman because she'll think less of you. He thinks you should confide in your bros emotionally. Pay attention. Women. All or almost all of that which pertains to love most straight men reserve exclusively for other men, the people whom they admire, respect, adore, revere, honor, whom they imitate, idolize, and form profound attachments to, whom they are willing to teach, and from whom they are willing to learn, and whose respect, admiration, recognition, honor, reverence, and love they desire those are overwhelmingly other men. In their relations with women, what passes for kindness, generosity, or paternalism, what passes for honor is removal of the pedestal. From women, they want devotion, service, and sex. Um, Shorty, go off. I think you find examples of those observations that I've just shared with you. Within manosphere culture to, uh, for instance, never be friends with a woman, or sorry, they always call them female. What is the benefit of being friends with a female? You sound like a fucking dork, bro. I can't obtain anything I'm interested in from a friendship with a female. What's the deal with having a relationship with a woman? And I'm with the kind of guy that's like, we're going to be best friends, right? I was like, yeah, we're best friends. What are you talking about, bro? Of course we're best fucking friends, bro. But also we also have best friends. Like we know what we mean when we say that. I'm in the romantic bubble where I'm best friends with my husband, but we know what we mean when we say that because he also has a literal best friend and I have a literal best friend. But we know what we mean when we say that because our friends are not us. And we are not our friends. I prioritize my husband over my friends. I love my friends and they're amazing. But like I'm not making, I'm building a life with my friends. I'm not that category of person. So like when shit hits the fan, you prioritize your partner, then your friends. But some people see their friends and their spouses as the same. And I don't. I don't have to respect my friends in the same way I respect my spouse. Like I can look at my friends and be like, you are a hot mess and I really fucking hate the way you make decisions in your life, but I love you and you're amazing. I can't think like that about my spouse. I can't look at my spouse and think like, ew, I do not respect your decisions, but I love you. I can't think that about my spouse. I'm not going to marry that person. But my friends, my family, my homies, my people, yeah, girl, I love you. I hate your decisions, but you do you, girl. You do you. Because, like, you're not making a life with me. I don't give a fuck what you do. I don't care how messy my friends are. As long as, like, my husband isn't messy. You know what I'm saying? I care if my husband's messy. I don't care if my friends are messy. Because, like, they're not here for my validation. They shouldn't be, at least. Like, my husband should be. My husband better be seeking my validation because, like, we're sharing reality. We're sharing life. Hello. Like, I don't even spend money without talking to my husband. He doesn't spend money without talking to me. Like, we talk about it. We have a threshold of, like, money we can spend. We kind of do the Dave Ramsey thing where Dave Ramsey and his wife talk about this, how they don't spend a certain amount of money without talking to each other. So same with him and I. Like, even to pay bills ahead of time. Like, I'm like, hey, let's look over the budget. Like, we're very, like, I'm telling you, we're taking it very seriously, our budget this year. We're trying to be adults, okay? It's very difficult. So it's like, okay, like, can I, should we spend this money here? Or should we spend, we, we're team. What should we do? We're best friends in a sense. We watch anime together and cuddle and gossip together. It's so great, right? But again, like we're building a life together. I don't talk to my friends before I spend money. I don't talk to my friends before I move somewhere. I don't like I might talk to them and get their advice, but like I don't make plans with them. You know what I mean? Hayda says, what does it mean to prioritize a husband over friends? Like choosing a husband over friends? Like, um, uh, uh, like I prioritize myself over my friends. So if I'm single, I prioritize my happiness over my friend's happiness, obviously. And I expect my friends to do the same. I wouldn't expect my friend to pick a job based off of my criteria. I wouldn't expect my friends to date people based off of my criteria. That's crazy. I wouldn't expect my friends to like dress based off of my criteria. I wouldn't expect my friends to like do anything based off of my criteria. That's so weird, right? But my husband, I expect him to do that because we are choosing each other over everything else, even over like, or at least equal to ourselves. Like my husband and I love each other the way we choose ourselves. So I'm not going to sit there and be like, I'm going to choose myself over my husband. No, we're choosing each other over ourselves. We're choosing the team over our individual selves. We're saying, yes, we're individuals in a couple, but like we're choosing each other. Like I'm not going to just spend money because I have money. It's our money now. You know what I mean? But my friends, like I would choose myself over my friends. If my friends were like, um, I don't know if they like, 
like I just don't plan a life with my friends. Does that make sense? Does you know what I mean? I'm not saying like choose my husband over my friends. Like my husband would make me pick my friends over him, and my friends wouldn't make me pick my them over my partner. Like the inner circle friends I'm talking about, like my writer dies, they wouldn't like make me choose them over my partner and vice versa. Like my husband wouldn't be like, you can't be best friends with your, no, my husband knew what he was getting into. He knew who my inner circle was. He knew who my besties were. And if he ever made me choose between him or my friends, like that wouldn't be my partner. That wouldn't be my soulmate just to be clear. Right. But like building a life. So you're a package deal. Um, I don't know exactly what that means. Cause that means different things in different bubbles, but maybe April says, love this. My nesting partner and I talk about before spending over like 50. Under that, we trust each other to make a wise financial decisions. Yeah, I think I have to ask my partner, like we know it instinctually. Like we know not to spend like on groceries, like we know to spend a certain amount or on like games or something like that. $15, $20 here, not a big deal. But like no one's going to spend like $100. Like no one's spending over 50 on a video game unless we talk about it. No one's spending 50 on Amazon unless we talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, that's definitely something we talk about for sure. Um, yeah, we talk about all that stuff because, again, like $50 here and there goes a long way. You know, it goes a long way. That's, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah, I don't want my friends to ever feel obligated to live their life based off of me. Like, I'm not their parent. You know what I mean? They don't need my approval. You do you. I trust you. I trust you to live your life even if it's messy. You know? Mm, budgets are a must and hard. <laughs> so difficult Ugh, it's difficult you know colleen says the three most misogynistic men i dated died before the age of 45 oh <gasps> stress does is a killer bros it is a killer you know it is a killer Brittany, very honest too i bet you would i doubt it wait it's all or nothing i do run my relationship it's all or nothing if that's what you're saying um are you guys the same age we're not we're a few years apart yeah um, how do you make decisions if you have disagreements or should you pick someone you wouldn't have major disagreements with? Um, so we, 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 we have a very specific relationship, right? Like we did a short term courting relationship. We were very serious. We got our families involved. We made a commitment based off values. And so we do agree on all the big stuff. So we already have and have learned from our parents' mistakes, we've read a bunch of books, we have a bunch of knowledge at our disposal. We're not, we're older, we're not going into this relationship in our early 20s, right? We're going into this relationship with a lot of discussion in mind, like a lot of discussion in mind, like huge amounts of discussion in mind. So we don't have big differences when it comes to values, which means we don't have very big disagreements. And when we have little ones, we usually we have a rule of like solving them in the day specifically if we or hopefully if we can in the moment. And usually we are just working together. So even when we disagree, I find that our disagreements and again, we're pretty new into our relationship. But for us, our disagreements feel like team building. You know what I mean? more than anything else. It just feels like we're team building. So when there's a problem, it's never with each other. It's with the thing that we're dealing with. That's kind of how we do it. Like with my parents, that's how they did it. When there was a problem, it was never with each other. It was with whatever like we're tackling. So if it's a budget, we're not pointing the figure and saying like, you spend more money than I spend. No, we are spending money on things that like need to go to a different category. Like it's never about them. It's about what are we doing? Um, plus we're both <laughs> low maintenance. So like, that's never a fight we're having. You know what I mean? We don't fight. Fighting to us means like we reached a point of like so much miscommunication that we aren't seeing each other to such a point where we're like basically emotionally abusing each other. Like we don't fight. We have disagreements that get solved within a few hours of the disagreement coming up. And it's usually, like I said, about tackling something else, if that makes sense. That you can't have sex with. I'm telling you, bro, if you're only being friends with other dudes because other dudes on the internet told you to, you're missing out. And that's kind of gay. <laughs> and I am not the only one that thinks so. So I have a friend that I uh, have these fairly emotionally rich and deep conversations with like once or twice a week or so. And a few weeks ago, he mentioned that he actually on aggregate at least, prefers his female friends over his male friends. And part of the reason was because it's more common to have deeper conversations with them. It's less shallow. Wait, Hayda, that's so relatable. It's so true. Fighting with my girlfriend means we're both hungry and tired. Okay, 
literally, I feel like 80% of the dis- – 99% of the disagreements my husband and I get into usually start with like some disagreement and then I go, have you had water? And he goes, have you had water? And I'm like, have you eaten? He's like, have you eaten? And I was like, I'll talk to you in five minutes after I've eaten. And then we're usually fine. And we usually disagree over literally like anime protagonist like theories and like – how to categorize people so we're really just disagreeing on the fun stuff like we don't really disagree about anything because we're just again we're again we're pretty new into the relationship but we're also very similarly minded so I think we have mostly disagreed on like anime related things so I'm literally like right now okay and again when I get snippy or short with him it's because I haven't eaten so he feeds me (laughs) I get hangry. If you will. And you know what? I kind of agree. I am so grateful for the female friends that I have in my life, bro. The only pushback that I can anticipate in regard to what I just said will and can only come, in my opinion, from guys that are insecure about their own masculinity. Guys who author of the 48 Laws of Power, Robert Greene refers to as the tough guy. In The Laws of Human Nature, he talks about these men as follows. The tough guy, he projects a rough masculinity that is intended to intimidate. Do not be fooled by appearances. Such men have learned to conceal an underlying softness and emotional vulnerability from deep within that terrifies them. They are notoriously touchy and thin-skinned. And I think that lack of softness, that inability to have a emotional vulnerability... Um... Magic says six years with my fiance and we honestly don't fight. We will disagree sometimes, but not even often. My exes and I would fight every week though. Literally, I would have like full-blown fights with my exes. And I was like, don't you think something's wrong in this relationship? We fight. And they're like, no, fighting is normal. And I was like, fighting does not seem healthy. This can't be normal. I didn't see this growing up. I don't like it. I, I think we should change like I think this is bad and they'd be like it's not bad it's normal and I'm like this is not normal so when I say like I don't fight my relationship when people on YouTube will be like Brittany's coping she's lying she totally fights there's no way everybody fights no my bros we really don't like fighting to the point where we're not listening we're yelling at each other we're demeaning each other we're calling each other names like no in healthy relationships no that's what I mean to say like you think it's normal because the world is unhealthy And it's normal because it's common, but guys, it's not good. I really mean this in the nicest way possible. Like, it's not good. And again, like, you can have your relationships. You can, like, fight with the ups and downs. You can do your thing. Like, you have your happy ending. You do you when building your romantic story. But mine does not involve abuse, cheating, yelling at each other, cussing at each other, demeaning each other, like, slamming doors on each other. Look, do we sometimes say things very human and we get our feelings hurt? We just talk about it. Oh, that hurt my feelings like 2%. Can we talk about it? Oh, actually, I'm, I'm a little sensitive today. Like, can we like curb it on these? You know what I mean? Like, okay. Again, you do you. But when I'm, okay, this is what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Now, again, I know someone somewhere is going to go like, my parents never fought. They never talked. They actually resented each other quietly. That's also the same thing as fighting. It's just quiet. Okay. Um, uh, Do you disagree about which version of Full Metal Alchemist is the best? Okay, can I be real with you? I've only seen Brotherhood. So I don't know. I never saw the other one. So yeah, you know, it is what it is. Discord says my parents never fought. They would have their different opinions or short moments, but it was always them figuring out stuff, never uh, one against another, a team. A lot of people around me took the never fought as never got into big arguments or slightly fumed, but not even close. Exactly. Discussions? Yes. Okay, yes, Discord. Discussions around disagreements, no fights. Exactly. I love a discussion. I love a disagreement. I love problem solving, but I'm not going to demean my partner. I am not going to cuss at him. I'm not going to slam a door on him. I'm not going to abuse him. I'm not going to like, I'm not going to like make fun of his body or like point out an insecurity of his when I'm upset. But I will tell you this right now. Am I pa- when I say I was pastly toxic, that's what I mean. I mean, I would fight very like low blow when I was in my 20s because like that was the environment I was in. And I was like, hey, I don't like this. I don't want to be having this conversation at three in the morning. Like, I think we need to go to counseling. And my partners were like, this is normal. And I'm like, this is a red flag. It's a red flag to be demeaning your partner, you know? Anyways, you do you. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. 
vulnerability with a woman is, third point in this section on women, the primary reason as to why red-pilled dudes will not have healthy relationships with women. And it's not because of the fault of women, it's because of their beliefs about women and relationships in general. Because red-pilled men do not know and do not want to learn how to play the love game because what they actually prefer to play is the power game. And so here's a clip, we'll deconstruct that and then we'll unpack what else True. I mean by the power game over the love game in a second. Who gives a fuck about a woman's orgasm? It's useless. And another telling thing too is that we asked the ladies on the panel yesterday. If my husband cares about my orgasm, thank you. He cares very much, I appreciate him so much. If a guy gave you great sex, would you still stay with him if he was a bum? And they said no. So why are you gonna do all this extra shit when it's not really, like I said, you're. You're stepping over you're, you're stepping over dollars to pick up quarters. I don't want to sound like an asshole, but a woman's ejaculation is irrelevant. Women derive their pleasure from serving a man they love, admire, and respect. And um, I keep a vibrator literally by my bed. Like girls like to come too, okay? Your children, I provide. So then you got to. And I'm also the breadwinner, so provide the ejaculations. <laughs> Before continuing, I need to introduce two terms from game theory and those terms- Actually, I will say he's right that men do want, or women do want a man who provides. And I do think like my man provides more than I could have ever hoped for um, because he he lets me like live out, he his life coincides with my life so much I get to live out like my dream. This is, I'm living my dream life. I worked so hard to have this life and he doesn't hinder it. He he only adds to it and vice versa. I feel like I'm, because I'm his partner, he gets to live like a really great life. I feel like we're giving each other an amazing life together. And it's amazing. I get to work. He gets to do whatever he wants. Like he gets to live his life. We get to eat food and watch anime together. He gets a partner that like is invested in One Piece and I get a partner who's invested in my animes. Like I can't wait to watch like all my anime. Like we have different animes and I'm so excited to do it with him. And I don't know, like, I think we, that's what a symbiotic relationship is, is I feel like we make our life so much better together. It's not about what gender, who's performing what role. It's literally just about, like, we make our, we literally are, because we're together, we get to have the best life ever. Even though our lives are really great before that, like, we both really loved our life before we were together. That's the thing that I think is interesting, too, is I chose a partner who had a life. He was, like, basically okay with and I had a life where I was basically okay and yeah we could have worked on certain things like we're still working on now like I'd like to be more solidified in my career he would like to do x y and z but for the most part like we were pretty happy with our lives so now we just get to do more you know what I mean <gasps> great question G what do you feel how uh, what do you feel about the baby mama bubble I feel like it's inherently toxic I think it is bad to make babies willy-nilly I feel like people shouldn't be having children in general. I think most people aren't qualified to be parents. Um, I don't think most people should be having babies. I don't mean that like black and white, like have a baby if you want to have a baby. But like, I just don't think you probably should be having babies. I think you should probably not be having babies. I don't think you're mostly like going to be good parents. I think you're going to be good enough, which is not even good enough. Um, I think if you have a title of baby mama, I think you're just saying like I'm toxic and a big red flag. I think having like men who have multiple babies and don't come home to them every night is a red flag. I think, you know, parents who don't tuck their kids in every night, like you should have thought about that before you had a baby. I'm on the part of TikTok where I'm in the like poverty or poor bubble where we're very anti having babies if you don't have the money to pay for them. If you were struggling to pay for yourself, if you were not sure if you're going to make rent next month, like you shouldn't be having a baby. You know what I mean? If you are so busy at work and you work 80 hours a week, like you shouldn't be having a baby. If you, you know what I mean? Like I'm very strict about like who should be having babies. Now, I don't want to enforce that with the law. But if you're asking my personal ethics, like there's a reason I'm thinking about not having a baby because I work seven days a week and hello, like I don't know if that coincides with being a good mother. Human race needs reproduction. I don't believe in the human race. You must be new to my content. Welcome. I don't believe, I don't care about the human race. Like, I don't care about sustaining it. I don't care about keeping it going. I don't think we matter to the universe. I think we only matter to ourselves. So I don't care. You know, like, 
I don't care. You know what I mean? Like the human race could disappear tomorrow and I think the planet would probably benefit from that. But like, I don't care. I think thinking it matters is silly. What about Nick Cannon? He's irresponsible, but the women can afford their kids with his support. I I think it's bad parenting, but like he can do him. I do watch Nick Cannon and the one girl who's a realtor. I watch their TikToks and I think it's funny. But yeah, I think um, I think it's irresponsible parenting and I don't think it's good enough. But like you do you. You don't have to live up to Britney's standard, guys. Like you don't have to live up to my standard. I don't even live up to my standard. That's why I'm not having a baby. Like probably. But like, you know what I mean? I'm not having a baby unless I live up to my own standard. And my own standard is about breaking generational curses. And you can't do that by repeating mistakes. You like I think the only investment that I think is the most important is harm reduction and breaking generational curses. And like I can't do that if I keep repeating mistakes. So you know what I mean, Jelly Bean? are zero-sum game and positive-sum game. A zero-sum game is a game wherein the nature of the game is adversarial. It is uh, against one another. The only way that one side or party or team can win is if another side, party or team loses. Conversely, a positive sum game, by contrast, is more collaborative. It's where both parties involved win. So, I would argue that love, so. when played correctly, is a positive sum game. It's as though the two parties come together. It's this motion. Whatever this is, that's what love is, okay? But the red pill seemingly teaches a relationship with love with one's partner that the relationship is fundamentally adversarial. The red pill's idea of love is zero sum if they even believe in love at all. Have you I don't. ever been in love? Vegan says, are you an anti-natalist? I'm not. Um, I'm not even sure if that's a real term, but it feels like un it's understandable. I'm not. I don't subscribe to any ideology in regards to like not having babies. I don't care if you have a baby. I just don't think you should. But I literally don't care. You're an animal, like you're gonna reproduce. To a woman? Female vaginas are disgusting. I've had. Uh, Miss P said, that's interesting, Brittany. It feels like that's a total change from like before you were with your husband and considering adoption and such. I'm still, we're still open to adoption, my partner and I, for the record. So we're very much open to adoption. We're open to adoption until we're like 60. So my husband and I are currently and forever basically open to adoption. We're very pro, like, like giving a home to a baby or to a teenager or to an older adult. So the older we go, the older we'll adopt, but we're very open to adoption for the record. I'd love for women, but I don't think, really? yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a man in a man's best interest to be in love with a woman. But anyways, back to this clip before moving on. Oh, I just wait, wanna... sorry. An Anna Littlis. Wait, I only know anti-natalist. What's this one? Hold on. I have to Google this one. I don't know what it Deconstruct the fucking logic behind. Sorry the lack thereof. So the only way that this premise is correct, that the female orgasm is useless, only works if you are acting- I'm- I'm nothing. I don't identify with these words. Natalist or anti-natalist. I'm not- I don't identify with any of these words. Under the premise that sex is merely for procreation. However, then you would argue in the event that procreation doesn't happen as a result of sex, then that sexual encounter was basically useless. And I don't even think Myron- particularly believes in his own logic, given that by his own estimations, he's had sex with over 300 people, and I doubt each and every time he had sex with those women, it was for the purposes of- You know what? Like, good for him. Procreation, you know? It's never about procreation. Additionally, the point of sex isn't fundamentally only for procreation. It's also for the sake of pair bonding, you know, the release of oxytocin, the other- Magic says my mom is considering fostering and I'm trying to push her to do it because she's such a good parent. My dad passed though, so I don't know how strict they are. My dad has passed though. I'm sorry about that. Um, that's awesome though. If she wanted to be a foster parent, we definitely need better foster parents too. Chemicals that are released in the brain to pair bond, to bring people together. Not that red-pilled dudes like Myron, for example, would even care for such a thing. Why would you ever become attached to a woman? After all, love is stupid. Maybe you're stupid. <laughs> I love when Leighton gets close to the microphone. <laughs> it does appear that in females... Oh, it's Andrew Heberman. Sexual stimulation and orgasm cause the release of oxytocin, whereas in males, sexual stimulation does not cause the release of oxytocin, but rather a different molecule, vasopressin. Yeah, pay attention. 
Andrew's a daddy. See, that's a that's a daddy right there. Is triggered by sexual stimulation, but orgasm does trigger the release of oxytocin in males, but with a delay of about 30 minutes. But it does seem that oxytocin is involved in the sexual response in both males and females. It's thought that in species that pair bond, humans generally pair bond, not always, they're The return to more parasympathetic activation after orgasm and ejaculation is thought to increase the exchange of pheromonal orders, odors, excuse me, and to increase pillow talk and pair bonding of different kinds. My guy is literally just wrong on all fronts. He just wants to dispose with the idea that he has any like responsibility in pleasuring his partner. You only need one ejaculation to create life and that's the man's. Now, with that said, does that mean I'm not going to please my girl or whatever? Of course I will, but it's elective. Definitely. He's so ugly when he talks. I feel like the only way to thrive in the world is to transcend your dra- trauma. G. I I think the, I think the only way to, well, depends on what you mean by thrive. I do agree that like transcending your trauma um, and like being introspective and having a good relationship with your consciousness is the key to finding like a very specific kind of joy. And I think everyone could have that joy, but it would take a lot, a lot of work. And I recommend you do that work, but you don't have to if you don't want to. And so it's one of those things where I do agree with you. I think a lot of people can also just learn to have a healthier relationship with their trauma. You don't need to transcend it. Like that's a very specific goal. But if you just have like a better relationship with it, I think you're, you would see a great improvement in your life. It's just like very hard. You know, and so that's the problem is that that's what I'm hoping to do on this channel, too, is like make it easier for you to figure that out. But the journey is still hard. Like I'm going to make it easier, hopefully, with my work to do that. But it's still going to be hard. So it doesn't change how hard it gets. It it changes maybe like, well, maybe we'll make it a little easier. I don't know. What do you guys think? Like if anyone feels like, oh, my work has made it like helpful, because I know I get a lot of feedback like that where they're like, oh, my gosh, like this is the this is the way I've been like needing to think about it. And that's great. I hope it makes it easier, but it's still hard. Like, you know, it doesn't, it's not like a cheat code is what I'm trying to say. In bed. And then the other part, you know, this idea of like, well, even if you care about her orgasm anyway, it's not going to make her stay. It's like, that is such a scare. He's a neuroscience. Um, Hotep says, is that man literally arguing with neurochemistry? So Andrew Heberman is a neuroscience. It's actually like, I'm so interested in neuroscience now, but he's a neuroscientist. So mindset reeking of like abandonment issues it's like why would i put effort into something that isn't magic dragon says yeah trauma doesn't seem to go away to me so for me i have definitely felt like my trauma is like going away over time but it's not completely there yet um because i know with borderline like eventually you can get re-diagnosed and over half of people who go through dbt um of the ones who had a really good relationship with good therapy in relation to borderline like they can get re-diagnosed without getting BPD. Don't listen to people that say if you have borderline, you're never getting better. Don't listen to people that are afraid of you because you have a personality disorder. Don't listen to people that are afraid of you because you have autism or neurodivergence. Do not listen to people that doubt you when they are literally riddled with trauma. Do not believe people who say you cannot get better. Do not listen to them. Do not pay attention to them. They are miserable, miserable, miserable humans. God bless them. I wish the best for them. They are miserable useless humans and they know it they know they're so useless that all they can do is spend time making it seem like everyone else is crazy except them do not listen to these people because they will ruin your possibilities of getting better if you let their evil little voices enter your heads you can get better therapy shows it science shows it every documentation every data point we have shows you can absolutely heal and have a better relationship with your trauma whether that means eradicating it, sort of, or having a very little, like very, a a very, a very good relation. You can have a very good relationship with your trauma. Do not listen to these people. It is imperative. It is imperative. You do not listen to these people. Okay. You absolutely can get better. They are, don't listen to these miserable people. Okay. Thank you, uh, Seven, for the super chat based on what Simon says. Okay. You absolutely can have a wonderful life. No matter how unique of a person you feel like you are, you have not have had such a unique life that someone can't relate to you. There is a book written about you. There is a media thing written about you. Somebody has lived a life similar enough to you. You are not alone. Do not listen to people that think like because of who you are, you can't get better. Okay? 
There are people right now that are studying to make your life easier. There are people right now that are working on coping mechanisms or cures for people with some of the worst personality disorders, the worst cancers, the worst sicknesses. You are not, you are not alone in this world. Okay. Like suffering is something we all universally experience and the relationship you have with your suffering, that's what you have the most control over. The most. Okay. I get very frustrated when I see these very big YouTubers or content creators or radio hosts or fresh and fit or whoever who say like, oh, people aren't going to get better. You're damaged. You're disabled. You blah, blah, blah. No, do not listen to those people. Those people are miserable people. The idea that like you didn't, you know, that you, again, don't listen to people that are miserable. Listen to people that are doing better than you because they will only cheer for you to get better. People who are doing better than you, people who are healed or on the healing process, people who are more introspective than you, they will be excited for your success. They will not talk bad of you. They will not give up on you in that sense. I know for a fact you can get better because I've gotten better. And I know I am not better than you. I know I'm not. We are all suffering. And you can absolutely have a better relationship with your suffering. Don't listen to miserable people. Like Leighton is saying, don't listen to Fresh and Fit. They're miserable. It's a sure thing that could leave me like you crying piss baby. <laughs> it's also particularly Machiavellian. So to do with like the dark triad traits, I'll do A, B, and C for you. So long as you respond transactionally with X, Y, and Z for me. So he's correct in saying, sure enough, giving a woman an orgasm doesn't guarantee that she stays. But I will say that not giving a fuck about the pleasure and enjoyment of your partner does guarantee that the probability of her leaving goes up. Private jets, we got you. Yachts, where you wanna go? Cars, Bugattis, let's go. Whatever your travel destination, I could take you there, but you can't come. Mars! <laughs> 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 this isn't even about sex. It has nothing to do with sex. This is not about like the whole dynamic of people not caring about women's pleasure, all that stuff. No. This is just a reflection of one simple thing. You are just a thing. Yes. You do your job, and I'll do the bare minimum. That's it. Because things don't have opinions. No. Things don't talk back. Things don't ask for more. I'm just saying, why not just engage in sexual experiences where you guys are thinking of both people's pleasure? I don't know. Sounds like a good time to me. So, expanding this idea that the red pill teaches guys that love is a zero-sum game, I once heard fresh and or fit mention that essentially when a woman has sex with a guy, it's an L for her, a loss for you not young whippersnappers, and it's a W for the guy. The guy goes up, the woman goes down. These people have done hundreds upon hundreds of these podcasts, and, you know, generally speaking, I do my best to fucking militantly cite every single thing that I say within the videos. Unfortunately, I can't find the clip that I'm talking about where Myron said, W for a guy, L for a woman. However, I do have something that is similar enough, so I'll read that to you now, dear viewer, coming from the mind of Emery Andrew Tate. Women are born with innate power, a form of magic, and every time somebody fucks them, they give some away. He takes it. That's why the most powerful men have slept with endless women, and the least magical women have slept with endless men. Why is this guy talking like a fucking anime villain? Like it's fucking go- We love a good anime villain. Goku summoning a spirit bomb and the more like energy he gets by having sex with women, he, the more powerful it becomes. Like, what are you talking about, my guy? What do you think <gasps> there's a, about the zero sum mentality that I- What's he? What's he in the handsome scale? I would put him at like a six. <clears throat> Five, six, five, six average said about the manosphere because that... what do you think his arms are nice though he's got a nice body his arms are nice um but like a if i was dating him i think he's very handsome because i think everybody i'm dating is very handsome because we're in love but i would put him at like a five six five six he's got great arms though that's how it feels to me it feels to me like i like his beard as well and i like his nose a lot of the fundamentally um good but, but I can't really tell what he looks like because he's turned and the shade is here. I need him to look straight at the camera because I can't really tell what he looks like, actually. I'm kind of face blind. Delivered poorly 
and with a- you think tate is more attractive than this guy yeah tate has more symmetry for sure this guy's interesting and that's why i like him more in a way um but i think tate is technically more attractive because he has more symmetry but my okay so my attraction i think i am more attracted to him than tate for sure okay so britney is definitely more attracted to this guy than tate for sure 100 percent more attractive but if I was to judge them on sort of a, a general scale outside of myself, I think Andrew Tate has more symmetry. But I like his unique features. This guy has a lot of unique features, which I like. So that's how I think I'd rate him. So Britney's scale, I would rate him higher because I really like the uniqueness of his face. And he has nice arms again. But Andrew Tate, I think, is technically more symmetrical. So I think generally he'd be considered more attractive. Does that make sense? A snide top spin advice from men sees any man's see i have bias like i kind of like the way his his face is very like jagged in like a caveman kind of way but i kind of like that gain as a woman's loss like it's it's weird that a lot of the time they're talking about um how to get women and to get with women and then when a woman does there's this sort of low-key i agree nail i just like more symmetry you said the more unique the better i agree personally So I would rate him higher than Tate. Like, I'm really not attracted to Andrew Tate, but I think generally, right? Admission that that's somehow their loss. Like, because you gave yourself away. Yeah, I really like his face too, Discord. To this guy that we've coached to try and get himself into the position of how he can have sex with you. Now you're a slut. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally toxic. It's bizarre. So I hope that just exemplifies that like within red pill spaces, there is this idea generally that love is zero sum, sex is zero sum. It's a W for you. It's an L for them. And even though, you know, I don't quite have the Myron clip at hand for the moment, I'm sure you can imagine that the guy that wrote fucking why women deserve less. I read that book. I I read that book. I read it. I have a podcast on it has this idea that love is a zero-sum game, that relationships with women in and of themselves are zero-sum. But again, red pill dudes, manosphere dudes, often think and speak in these very, like, business-like terms. So even the idea of, like, you being... Somebody was like, um, don't listen to Brittany. She thinks life's a game. I was like, yeah, life is a game, bro, but not, like, a game the way Myron means it's, like, a game. I, I mean, like, life is just, like, what you make it. Like, enjoy your life. You know what I mean? Like, pick a character think it's wow like design your care like live your life more attractive it's almost as if your conversion rate goes up or something and on that idea of conversion rate i think that's why a lot of young men red pilled men in particular are seeking status more and more and this- wait there's no way the science says that caitlin says i'm pretty sure the science says asymmetry is more attractive to humans i've never heard that my whole life in my bubble even babies prefer symmetry over asymmetry. But also, like, there's no way. Because, like, even anecdotally, like, generally, I'm always attacked when I say, like, people are attractive who are asymmetrical. Like, symmetry, even to babies, is more, like, safe to them. I've never heard that, but I'm not a scientist. I've I've always heard that even babies like symmetry, that you're weird if you like asymmetry in anybody. Actually, Leighton is very symmetrical to me. Like, he's... He has a real, a really nice face to me, genuinely. So I don't know. I've never heard that, but that I'm not a scientist. I don't know. It's very uh, defined, rigid way, because as far as they're concerned, they have to essentially turn themselves into an offer. They need to be able to market themselves as the best. Otherwise, by their logic that like women will just <laughs> leave because... Izzy, love you. Can't imagine the that leading life, the red pill way would help with loneliness epidemic. Literally literally thank you girl like literally how is this helping helping how's this help happening how is this helping jesus how important is hairstyle to you great question um i think grooming is important to me i'm middle eastern i'm a syrian everyone i know is bald so i don't care if you're bald but if you're balding you better shave your head i talked to my partner about this i told him because i'm like losing my hair I told him that if I'm losing my hair to such a degree that it looks like I'm desperately trying to keep it, just tell me so I can shave it off because I do not understand people who like cling to their hair as much as possible. Like I am too Assyrian for this, bro. So for me personally, like if if like you're well groomed, I'm into you. I don't care if you're totally bald. I don't care if you have a head full of hair. Like I, I'm just like, I don't care. I just care about like if you looked groomed to me so if you look groomed to britney's standards then i'm into you um but i don't care 
like personally. What do you guys think? Do you care on hair preferences? My brothers, I've told you guys this, they're Assyrian, obviously, so they're all bald. And they said that some of the two, I think two, two of them have a head full of hair. Mark and Tall Brother are the only two with hair. And even Mark is going bald now. So the two of them have hair and the rest are like balding or bald. And they said that women prefer them with like somewhat grown out hair than totally bald, which is insane to me. I could never imagine as a Britney finding a man who's like like George from um, Seinfeld. Like, why are you holding on to your hair? Like, why are you holding on to it? You know what I mean? But apparently women prefer that generally, I guess, over totally bald. So I thought, I thought that was interesting. You know what I mean? Um, bald Britney would be so base. I mean, you guys, well, maybe you guys haven't, but like I was bald at one point on my audience. But yeah, I'm happy. Like if I, if I get to the point where it feels like I'm holding on to my hair, like see, I'm like balding on the sides. I'm losing my hair here for sure. And then I've been losing my hair on top. See how it's sparse here too. Like I, I can't cover up my forehead enough with my bangs. So that's kind of more newish where I'm like, oh, I don't seem to have enough hair anymore right here. <laughs> my bangs are disappearing on me. <laughs> so I have nice hair right now, but it's, if it gets worse than this by like 30%, I think I'm probably going to start getting rid of some of it. Like I can't, I always wanted really long hair, but I I really don't want to be that person who's like desperately clinging to her hair. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Women always go for the better, the higher option because they're hypergamous, which as we went over in the day. Oh, wait, good point, Ingrid. I prefer not bald, not going to lie. At least get a beard. Wait, wait. Bald with a beard is my favorite. That's for sure the vibe. But like that is something, you know what I mean? Like... That is something, too, where, like, I don't like a clean-shaven face as much as I like a beard. I still haven't seen my husband's face. I still don't know what he looks like without a beard. <laughs> oh, my God. I married a man that I might not recognize in public if he shaved his beard on me. You know, it's kind of funny. Um. Oh, am I trying the medicine in Rogaine? So we – my husband and I have talked about it. Um, I don't care about my hair that much though. I'm going to be real with you. And then I heard, um, Bobby says I heard hair transplant is a good option. I don't care about my hair that much. I am not getting surgery to save my hair. And I kind of am exhausted at the idea of using Rogaine or even like rosemary or anything. Like there's something about my personality guys that just goes, nah, that's too much work. I don't care. Like, I really don't care enough to like do it. I might, I might, I might do rosemary. Because I've thought about it. But I just like, I emotionally cannot care right now. Like I've been bald before. I like me bald. So I'm not too worried about it. But yeah, like, and plus I like wigs. How fun. Every, a wig, every, like what if I just wore different wigs? So I'm not too worried about it, to be honest with you. I'm not complaining. Like I just, I don't know. You know what I mean? Raiders says, how long are you streaming for, Brittany? Um, Basically till the end of this video and we'll chat for a bit. And then I'm going to head out because I need to rest because I'm sick app video is not necessarily there's a hypergamy element that is true that we went over but this idea that like fundamentally you know if you're on six figures but you meet someone that's on seven she'll just like leave you for them because his on papers are better red pill dudes are trying their best to make themselves indispensable i'm so sorry oh my gosh drizilla that's so interesting nobody recommended rogaine to you because you're a woman and in the fifth grade but it worked for you that's amazing that's like amazing so that they can play the power game better you can't leave me i'm x y and z where are you gonna find somebody better than me people are not going to be quick to replace something or attempt to replace something which is basically see i couldn't date a guy who wore those shoes or those pants like i'm not into this man he's like it's an attractive look but i'm not into it personally i'm like where's the anime tee how would i wear the skinny jeans replaceable <laughs> so if you're a high enough status individual I guess those are skinny jeans skinny slacks then you get to get away with more it's almost as if they had like a container for where their ideas of love would go into and rather than pouring in something that's more healthy and long-term sustainable they like read the 48 laws of power and poured that in there instead so now they just think of love in power terms and can't stop themselves you don't want to appeal to people's love to the fact that they like you you want to appeal to the fact that they need you. Baby boy, for the love of God, please stop getting your advice from these guys online that don't even care about love, that don't True. care about kindling or- That's the question. 
Do you, are you guys looking for love or are you looking for a sugar daddy? Are you looking for love? Are you looking for a father figure? Are you looking for love like an equal partner that values you and sees you and really knows your consciousness? Or are you looking for, what are you looking for? Even encouraging and helping you to create a long-term, loving, sustainable relationship. If they actually cared about your long-term prospects, they would stop focusing on this kind of superficial bullshit over here and start talking about things that do actually predict a long-term relationship. Ooh, if you want a long-term relationship, right? I think a lot of people are in denial. I don't think a lot of people want to be in love. I don't believe you. I don't think a lot of people want to be partnered. I think a lot of people just don't want to be lonely. That's not the same. Jesus, Andrew Tate's got that old money clothing mindset. Can I? Okay, did you guys see Becoming Anna or Anna? I want to watch it. It's on, I think, Netflix. I'm It's a show, and I'm literally going to watch it about that Anna girl who pretended she was from old money. And apparently she knew the bubble so well that she would, like, order old money stuff, dress old money, know old money. Like, it's a bubble mindset. Like, you need to be in the bubble and know the culture. Like, I would never know what kind of wine to order to signal that I'm old money. I wouldn't even know how to order wine. Do you know what I mean? It's so interesting. I want to watch it though. Success, such as, I don't know, kindness. But you asked about income and I want to- <gasps> I love the Shoals podcast. And look, Andrew Heberman. Make sure that, because I had David Buss on my podcast and he's really the expert on this. So yes, it's true that resource potential is an important variable because people have to think about safety and childcare and a number of things. More important than any other feature across all cultures is that- the woman reports that she sought someone who is kind to them. Okay, so even if you think of like extreme money, right, extreme money, or you think of extreme bodies or extreme resources, right, that somebody has, women in terms of who they tend to pair up with long term, what is shown up over and over again in the data is that their top priority is that someone be kind to them. Mm. Boom. Boom. In other words, they're not interested in being with someone who's really wealthy, who treats them like garbage. Is that and also- And I think this gets lost because people think, oh, it's all about money. It's not all about money. Okay. It's, about, it's about safety and kindness because you're talking about a long-term bond. So maybe it would be a good idea- Unless you don't want a long-term bond. ...to take on board that kind of idea instead of continuing with beliefs such as this thing that I'm about to read you, Good friend is late 30s, in shape, makes over 300k a year, has a condo overlooking a great downtown, one of the top 10 biggest penises I've seen. Pause. He gets constantly ghosted, ignored for days, and is told after a date or two that this isn't working. Modern women are broken. Imagine that being the kicker. Okay, so you were told to get rich, get in shape, have the house, have the car, etc., and women still don't want to be you. Your personality, that guy's personality must be so fucking clapped to dissuade women that by all the red pill accounts, women should be fucking throwing themselves at him because, he, you know, he's done everything and yet they still don't. Maybe. Red pill ideology in regard to getting women, at least, bites off way more than it can chew. Maybe the red pill has got. It's I feel like the red pill is good for working out and making money by scamming men into convincing them that they're lonely because women suck. And then, yeah. The equation, incorrect. I'm gonna explain in a future video that whilst I do think that the red pill's preoccupation with attaining things like power and status and money, fundamentally, I think those things are good. You probably want those things on your side more than not. However, I do think that proclivity for focusing on it so much, so intently at the dispense of borderline everything else fundamentally comes from a trauma response, either from the relationship that they have with a parent or both or a previous relationship. And I know on the surface that probably won't make sense to you watching, but I will unpack it in a future video. I promise you, baby boy. For now, I do just want to say that I find it so ironic, so tragically ironic, that whilst red pill manosphere ideology encourages men in particular to be so courageous and forthright and lacking in fearfulness, and yet they are so fearful mm. of being vulnerable. Mm. You may think that that is bizarre of me to say, or as though I'm like advocating for men to be weak or what have you, which I don't think that I am fundamentally. I'm merely saying that in order to conjure, say, love, connection, vulnerability is a precursor. And whilst being protected and defended in, say, something like a suit of armor, metaphorically speaking, if you are wearing a suit of armor, you fundamentally cannot make a 
genuine connection with somebody else because you're fucking plated up from top to bottom mm. how are you supposed to connect you know the Krabby Patty secret formula to love necessitates that there is vulnerability involved and red pill manosphere ideology is fundamentally dissuading men from I just want the red pillars to say that in their shtick because they do pretend that they care about their partners they pretend they do have love and look that's the problem is like, are we, okay, let's be a little nuanced because like people will hear me talk and they'll say like the way you talk makes me feel like you don't think my relationship is about love. And I'm like, oh, that's like really interesting. What I mean to say is I don't think we're describing love in the same way with the same criteria. So if you have a relationship like Andrew Tate and his partner, that is not a relationship I understand. Or if you, well, I understand it, but it doesn't fit in my bubble. If I see a relationship where you're fighting every day and you're cussing at each other, like I would say that's not the kind of love I dreamt about as a little girl. Like I feel like I attained the love I dreamt about as a little girl. I, I attained that partner that I read about in books. I got that love life. Like I feel like I got the, I won. Like if that's the way you want to phrase it. But I don't mean that. I just mean that I, I came across that person that I've been waiting for, the only reason I would ever get married. And so for me, it's very special to get married. I would never get married casually. I would never get married to help you with your green card. I would never get married to keep dating you. I would never get married to like bail out. Like I would just never get married unless I was seriously in love with this human and wanted to like die with this human. So I am like incredibly like I am signaling my vulnerability by by getting married to you. The reason why marriage is a big deal to Brittany is because like I don't get married. I'm happy to date you. I'll even move in with you, but I'm not marrying you. And so for me, like getting married was a big deal. Now, to be fair, for my last partner, when I was single for three years while I was dating, I never, I decided I wasn't going to move in with a partner again because like I hate moving people out. But for me, like getting married is about moving in together, about starting a life together at this point in my life. Because again, in my 20s, I lived with partners. I never mixed money with my partners, funny enough, but I lived with them. Like we would split rent and utilities and stuff. But or I would pay the bills depending on the partner. And then now it's different. Now we share everything. Everything is like ours and mine and yours and everything is shared. But again, like I I I think it's hard when we're having these conversations not to make people feel hurt that like, oh, are you saying like I'm not in love? But like when I have a caller come to me and they're like, hey, I broke up with my partner. I'm like, are we relieved? They're like, yeah or no or maybe or yeah I think it's the right choice I'm like oh my god thank god because like honestly like years ago when you told me about them I was like I don't think this is your partner but that's the thing is like I'm not here to tell you to break up with your partners unless you ask me but I kind of feel like if you're asking me that's probably the sign do you get what I'm saying like if you're looking at your partner and you're wondering like are they the one and you've been dating for a year they're probably not your soulmate Right. If you are telling me you are marrying your soulmate, but you believe in short term relationships and one day like you'll leave that soulmate to be with somebody else. Like, I don't know how many of your soulmates you're meeting in a lifetime, but it seems to be a rare occurrence in mine. So I'm not letting them go because like my soulmate and I did not wait all this time to meet each other just to have a short term relationship. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe if I was in not a soulmate conversation, like, you know what I'm saying? That'd be different. But I couldn't imagine waiting like my life or even having the statistical probability of meeting a soulmate and being like, hey, can I trade you in for a different person? It's like, who? Like, who is this other person? You know what I mean? Like, no. So again, I think we're all having a different relationship with these things. It's all fine. But when I'm talking about finding love or a relationship, I mean, literally, I, f I found the person that I want to talk to for the rest of my life. I found a person that wants to talk to me for the rest of their life. We are both such little homebodies and we want to spend every moment with each other. Like I'm so excited to end this live stream because I know we're going to want to hang out. Even if he's busy and doing something else, when he's ready, we'll hang out. And that's so exciting for me. And so again, like in my past relationships, I needed space for my partners in a really significant way. I wasn't always happy with their decisions. I would look at them and think like, I don't really respect you, I think. You know what I mean? And so it's different. The Metasphere is teaching you how to have a specific kind of relationship with people that is about like business and business alone. And I think that's one way to have a relationship. But for me, I need the va va voom as well. I need the romance as well. I need us to be on the same page. Do I want us to be successful? Yeah. 
<clears throat> do I want us to be like have goals and and hit the yeah. I just want it to be about us as a team, like a team. Fresh and fit, they sound like two individuals being together that like match together, but I don't like that. My partner doesn't need me to look at him on a pedestal and he doesn't put me on a pedestal. We're the same. We're equal. But fresh and fit and all these other relationships are like, a woman looks up to me. I'm her pedestal. It's fine. You do you. But in Brittany's mind, like that's not true love. And again, I'm, I don't mean to judge your relationships, but like if you're dating a relationship where you ever, where you don't see your partner as like on the same page as you, I think that's like weird in a way but you do you like again you do you okay um, being able to either be vulnerable as well as see the utility see the value within it which is sad because i think primarily you know men and women are looking for the same thing once you get past the artifice and that same thing eh, of, some men and women of course is intimacy i learned that I love intimacy, but not everyone's looking for intimacy in the same way, and that's what's kind of key. That intimacy is the only thing I'm looking for. And when I say that, intimacy really means that someone knows you, all your stuff, everything about you, good and bad, and loves you anyway. What do mean? Loves you anyway? But your good and bad goes with their good and bad. Meaning the things that are bad about me are bad about my partner. They, they are never actually truly going to ruin our relationship or be truly bad. Like everything about my partner, I really love. Even his bad is kind of like, eh, I can work with that. Not a big deal. But like when I dated people whose bad was really like, I just like, it made me, it gave me the ick. That's not your partner. I think you need to be able to see your partner and like understand them. But also like, again, you have to like kind of be on the same page about how you respect them as well. And again, I don't think you should be cheating on your partner, neglecting your partner on again and off again with your partner. I don't think your soulmate is somebody that you need to question being with. I don't think your soulmate is somebody that you need time to think about in a real way. I don't think your soulmate is somebody and I don't mean like a magical soulmate. I just mean someone you're incredibly compatible with. Now, of course, you can form any relationship with any person. Studies show that you don't actually have to be in love with your partner to eventually fall in love with them. You can have a, a relationship where you eventually fall in love with them. I'm not that person, though. I'm not in the category of human in which I could marry someone I wasn't already in love with. Oh, my gosh. You know how we talked about that on the show like last week? I tried to make a joke with my partner for just a second where I told him that. I was like, this lady said she fell in love with her husband after they had their baby. And he goes, what? I was like, yeah, actually, if I'm being honest with you, I think I fell in love with you at our, and he goes, stop, don't even joke about it. And I was like, Ooh. and then we like giggled together because it's true. Like we're such romantics that if we literally thought we weren't in love before we got married, I think it would crush us. It would be so devastating to our love story because I'm like, that means you lied to me when you said you were in love. To like, do you get what I'm saying? This woman got married and didn't love her husband until she had his baby. You do you. You do you. If you want to take that, you do you. But I couldn't handle that. Now, falling in love isn't enough. And again, you have to be responsible. You have to be thoughtful. You have to actually have the same values and like at least similar morals, you know? Invite or allow that level of intimacy. Well, first of all, it's it requires vulnerability it yeah. requires you you can't get intimacy without vulnerability it's impossible mm. because you're going to have to tell which is why fuck boys and people like andrew tate even will desire vulnerability from the women to get the intimacy from them but not give it back in a symbiotic way and it's why it's so painful to women and men who have to deal with like people that like ask them to be vulnerable without giving it back it's like oh my gosh your stuff because if you can't tell you'll never find intimacy <gasps> Cree says i took that as falling deeper for him the video we watched last week really i didn't take it that way at all but maybe so but that's the only thing you're looking for so what happens is you get sex sex and love two different things lots of sex and it's always unfulfilling because you're not getting what you need 
Baby boy, there are very few things guaranteed in this life. However, if you got to this point in the video, if you allow me to merely get through the next 30 seconds of YouTube formalities, I assure you, <laughs> I guarantee that you will uh, be excited. And so, first and foremost, I just want to say, please, baby boy, drop a like on the video, uh, leave a comment down below, because as usual, I'll be snorkeling down there, and, uh, you know, hopefully some lively discussion will be happening down there. Interact with one another, interact with me. On the end card, I will have videos talking about uh, dating apps, which I mentioned throughout this video, as well as the video that kicked off this mini-series about men in the first place, men's relationship with Jordan Peterson. If I've left out anything from this video, which invariably I probably have, you know, I can't say everything, um, you know, check the pinned comment down below, wherein you will also see should you want to, and you do want to, because you're a latonical oh super fan. Oh, I'm gonna so much analyze reading. myself. Anyway, free blog post uh, for Patreon that you don't necessarily have to be a patron for in order to read. However, if you would like to be a patron... Like yeah, Patreon is this weird thing now where, like, there's free patrons, like, people who are just for there for free to see your timeline, but then they don't see the posts that are for... Because they're trying to be, like, a social media thing. So, like, you can join my Patreon for free and see the timeline, and then that way if you see a post you want to unlock, you can just, like, pay for Patreon and unlock it. And also, in December, I... In December, I'm doing... Just a few discounted hour-long calls for Christmas to celebrate Christmas for people. But they're very few because I have to get them done before Christmas because everyone's got to go home for the holidays. So um, if you are interested in doing a call with me for an hour, wait until December, which is just in two days. And I'm doing discounted one-hour calls only for December. And it's only a handful of them. So wait until December if you want to sign up for calls, if you want a little bit of a Christmas discount. You know, because <laughs> holiday cheer and all that gay stuff. Like these incredible people on screen right now, then please go over to the Patreon and help me create more things like this. I think it's fair to say that the red pill is collapsing. And so there seems to be no greater time than right now to deconstruct the remaining lies that are True. no doubtably permeating True. either your brain or the brains of many men. True. This grift has taken enough of your money, men. Bye, Leighton. We love you. Okay, I will say this. First of all, Lane makes great content, so go subscribe and like his video and all that stuff. I'll share it again in the chat. Um, and I will say, I don't know if the red pill is uh, dying as much as, because there's always going to be somebody in this group, right? Like, does anything ever die? But I will say I look forward to a time when people are able to deconstruct the bubbles that have left them so sad for so long. And I think there's something to be said about it. And look, I felt this in feminism. I felt this in, like, different bubbles I was in. It's never enough to stay in your victimhood. It's just not fulfilling. And if you are in a bubble where they blame everyone else for their problems, the system, whether even if it's racism, like, yes, these systems exist. There's obviously issues in the world, but you as the individual consciousness, you can learn to play around those issues. You can learn to like figure out how to move around those issues because the relationship you're having with yourself is specific, right? So again, I really look forward to that part of watching people deconstruct is like, not to replace it with a different bubble of victimhood, but to actually have a relationship with your consciousness where you can recognize in the ways you've been a real victim, and that's fine, and then in the ways that that's not going to define you for the rest of your life, because that's really important. I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me Cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, 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 da.